we are ready to reconvene. Uh, the commission um, concluded the executive session. We are now back into public session of uh, public meeting number 77, uh, about 1.30. Um, I think we have agreed that we're not going to be able to get to the rest of the agenda items uh, on public meeting 77 because we have another important matter to get to. I think we're going to have to try to schedule a, a special public meeting, hopefully next week, where we can kind of catch up. Um, but we'll be in touch with everybody uh, about that as soon as we can get a date nailed down. Um, so unless there is any other business pending, um, I would have entertain a motion for adjournment of public session number 77. Uh, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Eyes have it unanimously. Now we will reconvene uh, our uh, adjudicatory hearing uh, on the Penn National application. And I think, I, although we're in the midst of hearing witnesses from the applicant, uh, I just wanted to check with Mr. Mackey and, and Director Wells whether you've got anything else to start us off with. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, we do. Uh, I think Director Wells would like to read into the to the record a, uh, the results of uh, uh, some additional investigation done uh, last night with respect to an individual identified during yesterday's hearings. It's been shared, as I understand it, with the applicant's counsel and don't, don't believe they have any objection. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Based on the inquiry by the commission uh, yesterday and, and a request for further information, uh, the members of uh, Spectrum Gaming uh, conducted a phone interview with uh, Mr. Stephen Ducharme. Mr. Ducharme is the chairman of the Penn National Gaming Compliance Committee. He was telephonically questioned regarding the hiring of Frank Donahue as a compliance officer in light of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, which was discussed yesterday. Donahue was replacing placing Thomas Oriama. Mr. Ducharme stated he remembers the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, but did not recall specific details of the report, including the specific allegations pertaining to Donahue. He recalls discussing the report with Jordan Savage and Tom Ariama, but does not recall specifics of those conversations other than that where they were in agreement that Donahue should still be hired. He also, uh, uh, <clears throat> he also telephonically interviewed Frank Donahue at Jordan Savage's request. He does not recall specific details of the Donahue interview, but, do, but does, not and does not recall anything derogatory. Ducharme's assessment is that the grand jury report did not contain any criminal wrongdoing and did not contain any derogatory information which was significant enough to prevent Donahue from being hired. His recollections, the report contained smoke but no fire, and Donahue's background, experience, and qualifications far outweighed any allegations pertaining to him. Ducharme considered the information in the report to be more allegations than proven facts. He realized that PCGB and BIE could have done a better job and attributed this to growing pains. He, along with Savage and Oriama, supported the hiring of Donahue. Thank you. Any comment on that additional testimony? No, Mr. Chair. Um, okay, I think we are ready to um, go to the applicant to pick up the ball. Our next witness uh, is Mr. Donahue. Uh, but Chair, we do have some, as you may recall, some additional witnesses who are coming today who have not yet been sworn. If you want to swear them now, sure. we can do it all at once. Yeah. Later on. Right. Uh, we'll find that. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and there is an additional witness that we have proposed to call, Thomas or Ariema, uh, who is here. Um, do we, we have given notice to Mr. Mackhead. Do we know? That I have. We have no objection. No objection. So there'll be uh, three additional witnesses. Be brief. Yeah. They'll all be brief. Right. Three right. additional witnesses. <coughs> in addition. Uh, hopefully, right. Hopefully, they and we will be brief. Yes. Um, all right. So, any uh, any witnesses um, who uh, potential witnesses for today who have not already been sworn in, uh, please stand and raise your right hand. Does, does each of you solemnly swear that the testimony you will provide before the commission of this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. All have responded in the affirmative. Thank you. And, uh, I guess I'm going to say, Mr. Chairman, for the record, those are Mr. Carlino, Mr. Wilmont, and Mr. Ariana. Right. Okay. And we'll now proceed with uh, Mr. Dunning, who was born yesterday. Uh, Mr. Dunning, could you start by uh, 
give us a quick summary of your background, uh, including your extensive law enforcement experience. Uh, and note for the commissioner's benefit, there is an Exhibit uh, 13, uh, and Exhibit 13, which is Mr. Donahue's uh, biographical statement, so we won't dwell on this, but you did want to run through some of the high points. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, again, Frank Donahue, and I'm the Vice President of uh, Regulatory Affairs and the Chief Compliance Officer uh, for Penn National. I uh, graduated from uh, Catholic University uh, in Washington, D.C. In, in 1990, and uh, Widener University School of Law uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in uh, 1993. Uh, following law school, um, I was employed as a law clerk uh, for the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Supreme Court with uh, Supreme Court Justice Castile. I then uh, had the opportunity to serve uh, 10 years with the uh, Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office. Uh, I served under uh, former Attorneys General uh, Mike Fisher, uh, Jerry Pappert, and uh, Tom Corbett, uh, who of course is now the uh, Governor of Pennsylvania. For the final six years, uh, I was the Chief uh, Deputy Attorney General in charge of the Bureau of Consumer Protection, uh, which is the largest uh, section within the uh, Attorney General's Public Protection Division. Um, and I oversaw a staff of about uh, 60 attorneys uh, and agents. Uh, we handled uh, about 40,000 written complaints from consumers uh, each year and uh, handled 150 legal actions a year, um, ra ranging from uh, small legal actions all the way up to uh, against large corporations for allegations of uh, wrongdoing of the, under the Pennsylvania's Consumer Protection Law. Uh, during that time period, I also had the privilege to serve uh, with Attorney General Mike Fisher as one of the lead negotiators uh, for the tobacco settlement, uh, which of course uh, resulted in uh, $206 billion uh, in um, uh, national tobacco settlement uh, funds uh, given to the states uh, back in 1998. From uh, March of 2006 to 2008, I served as the first chief counsel to the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. Uh, my duties and responsibilities in that position were to provide legal advice uh, to the board and to the, to the agency. In 2008, uh, I was named the acting executive director uh, of the agency while they conducted a review, a national review for uh, hiring uh, a permanent executive director. And then for a year after that, I served uh, as the interim deputy executive director of the uh, Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. And during that period, uh, although we had original, originally um, allowed for slots, uh, the legislature also allowed for table games. And so I, was, uh, I helped in the process of uh, writing the regulations for table games in, in Pennsylvania. From um, June of 2010 through 2011, I served as a, of counsel with the uh, Ballard uh, Spar Law Firm in uh, Philadelphia. <coughs> I'm a member of the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Bar Association. I live in Hershey with my wife and, and three children. I've got a 16-year-old boy, a 14-year-old girl, and a 7-year-old girl. That's my, uh, that's my background. Okay. And in addition to being a member of the Pennsylvania Bar Association. You're also a member of the Pennsylvania Bar. Bar, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> licensed attorney. Sorry, and, I misspoke. <laughs> okay, speaking of uh, licenses, in how many uh, jurisdictions are you, uh, do you hold a gaming license? I, I hold a gaming license in uh, nine uh, jurisdictions. Um, New Mexico, Louisiana, Indiana, Maine, Colorado, Canada, Maryland, Ohio, and, and Pennsylvania. Um, and, and I would also add with regard to Pennsylvania, the um, the, the Bill Ryan, who's the acting, who was the acting attorney general in charge of the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office at the time the grand jury report was issued, subsequently became the chairman of the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. Um, at the time of my licensure, uh, he was chairman and he voted in favor of my uh, licensure, uh, along with all the other members of the Pennsylvania Board. Okay. And you mentioned uh, Ohio. And Yes. Um, was you're familiar with uh, an outfit called Spectrum Gaming? Sure. They, and they've assisted the commission in this uh, proceeding. Right. And Spectrum Gaming did uh, my investigation uh, when um, they did the investigation for the Ohio Casino Control Commission, um, and uh, I was also voted voted in favor of my uh, license in Ohio. Okay. And that that license in Ohio was approved uh, before or after the grand jury report? After we discussed yesterday. Okay, sorry. After? After, yes. Okay. Okay. And let's, let's get right to that. Then you were here yesterday when there was questions and testimony regarding that uh, grand jury report about the Pennsylvania Board. Sure. Uh, first, could you uh, tell us uh, generally about that report, the little background, how it came to be, and your uh, participation in the grand jury proceedings? Sure. So uh, on May 19th, 
2011, I appeared um, before the 31st uh, statewide grand jury as a witness. Um, I, I was one uh, witness of about uh, 20 or so other current and former uh, board members of the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. Uh, there were other individuals who, who testified, um, not from the PGCB, uh, in, including uh, Fred Gushin of uh, Spectrum Gaming. Um, the grand jury examined the issuances of licenses in Pennsylvania uh, in 2006, about seven years ago. I cooperated fully with the process. Um, although the report was critical of uh, some of the decisions, uh, there was no finding of any criminal wrongdoing. Uh, there was no findings of any wrongdoing by me. Um, there were no presentments or, or indictments um, that were issued out of the grand jury. In Pennsylvania, a grand jury can issue a report. Um, and and um, I, I understand in other jurisdictions they can just issue indictments or presentments. But in Pennsylvania, they can issue a report. Um, the grand jury issued a number of recommendations um, to improve the regulatory oversight of gaming uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Many of those recommendations I, I agree with today. Um, I think there was always a room for improvement, particularly when you're building a, a brand new agency from the, from the ground up, as, uh, as I did uh, along with uh, uh, many other people. Uh, and I'm also extremely uh, proud of the, of the accomplishments that, uh, that we ultimately had in, in Pennsylvania. Okay, Mr. Dunn, next maybe if you could just <clears throat> briefly tell us how the uh, Pennsylvania Board was organized at the time that you were there, and in particular in 2006, and we have, and we provided to the council uh, an organizational chart, which I yeah, asked the witness to identify. And is there an objection, Mr. Mack? Uh, I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't seen it, but I'm, I'm sure. Uh, sorry. We'll call that uh, Pen Exhibit 19. Okay. Mr. Donahue, if you could uh, take a look at that and, and first maybe you could just tell us, uh, what, do you know where this organizational chart came from? Um, it came from the, uh, the website, uh, the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. So is this, uh, to your understanding, uh, an organizational chart for the board and its staff as it exists today or back in 2006? I, as I understand, as it exists today. Okay. Could you just, uh, you've, you've looked at this before. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us, uh, is it uh, more or less uh, the way you understood the organizational chart of the board to exist in 2006? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. And then if I could have you, because just because there'll be some names that have come up or will come up, uh, to point out uh, where th these people fit in this chart, and I want to start with you. Mm -hmm. You were the chief counsel. Where are you on this chart? So I would be um, right in the middle where it would say Office of Chief Counsel, and then you would have uh, several of those boxes that would be under me. I would uh, report up to um, the executive director and to uh, the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board, seven-member board. And uh, there's uh, been or going to be some discussion about the Bureau of Investigations and Enforcement. Can you tell us uh, about generally what that was and, and who was the head of that? So the head of the Bureau of Investigations and Enforcement was uh, Dave Quaite. Uh, that is to uh, my right of that, uh, of that box. Okay. And who was the executive director? Uh, Ann Neeb. Neeb, N-E-E-B? Correct. Okay. And uh, how about... Uh, Michael Schwoyer. So he would have been the uh, head of the Office of uh, Enforcement Counsel. And so the Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement and the Office of Enforcement Counsel, they would have administratively reported to Ann Neeb, um, but there, they were um, an, an independent um, sections for purposes of enforcement of the Act. Okay. And the last name I want to ask you about is uh, someone named Nan Davenport? Yes. Where does she fit in this chart? She would fit um, under the Office of Enforcement Council and the Central Regional Office. Okay. So how this is set up, just so we're, we're clear, uh, were you David Quaite's boss? No. Were you Michael Scheuer's boss? No. Were you Nan Davenport's boss? No. All right. Could you tell us then, uh, in the Pennsylvania Board, generally, uh, how and by whom 
suitability reports were investigated and written. Sure. So uh, generally, the suitability reports would have been uh, assembled by the licensing division. Um, and um, in general, the background investigations for those suitability reports would have been done by the, uh, the Bureau of Investigation uh, and Enforcement, uh, along with uh, the counsel that worked for the Office of Enforcement Counsel. Uh, again, the director at that time was David Quaid. Uh, the chief enforcement counsel was uh, Michael Schwoyer. Um, BIE uh, attorneys and agents who investigated and wrote that portion of the suitability report, such as Nan Davenport, would have re reported to uh, Michael Schwoyer. Again, they did not report to me. Okay. Uh, one other name I wanted to ask you about. Uh, who was the chair in, in 2006? Who was the chair of the Pennsylvania Board? Tad Decker. Okay. So he goes up Tom. at the top of the top. Correct. Of the Thomas Decker. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, one matter uh, discussed in the grand jury report was the uh, Mount Airy suitability report. Is that correct? That's correct. Could you tell us about that report? Sure. So to give you some context, um, the, the Mount Airy suitability report, it's, it was one of a couple of dozen um, reports that um, we were uh, reviewing and uh, working on at the time. Uh, the Mount Airy suitability report went through almost a, a dozen um, drafts before uh, I saw it for the first time. Uh, I saw the first time the, the, the draft of the report uh, after the staff's investigation was substantially complete and shortly before the, the board was taking up uh, Mount Airy for uh, suitability considerations. Uh, the, the draft report contained uh, discussions about issues concerning uh, alleged violations of campaign finance laws. Uh, and allegations of uh, improper uh, titling of a tractor trailer uh, as a result of um, the Katrina hurricane um, uh, by um, Mount Airy's uh, principal, uh, Lewis de Naples. In addition to those two categories, um, the report also contained information about uh, Mr. de Naples' alleged connections to uh, uh, two uh, people uh, allegedly uh, tied to organized crime, one by the name of Mr. D'Elia, the other one uh, named uh, uh, Mr. Shams Ali. Um, there was other issues in the report um, as well, such as uh, Mr. DeNaples' uh, 1970s uh, conviction for jury tampering. Um, I recall participating in a, an internal staff meeting in which the report was discussed at length um, with Executive Director Ann Neeb, Chief, en Chief Enforcement Counsel uh, Michael Schwer, Deputy Enforcement Counsel Nan Davenport, uh, Agent Roger Greenbank and um, Deputy Counsel Moselle Daniels, and, and uh, they were among others. I just can't remember, you know, who was in that room <coughs> seven years ago. Um, at that meeting, the consensus, um, the decisions were made to, to revise uh, and finalize the report. Uh, the information about the uh, campaign contributions, it's also referred to as RAM, I think you heard yesterday, RAM, uh, and the truck sales uh, were supported by the, uh, by the substantial evidence. Uh, that information remained uh, in the report. Um, and I also believe that uh, information, um, there was other information that would, uh, that, that information, I'm sorry, would pose uh, substantial obstacles uh, to um, Mr. DeNaples uh, being found suitable. Um, with regard to information about uh, allegations of organized crime associations, uh, including Mr. D'Elia, uh, decisions were made to attach um, the uh, Pennsylvania Crime Commission report as, as an exhibit uh, to the uh, suitability report. Um, my recollection was that there was also a, um, a search warrant uh, affidavit that was um, uh, attached as an exhibit to the report and um, along with other documents. Um, that information, along with uh, other information contained in the report, was discussed in executive session among the board members, uh, where BIE counsel was present, where uh, counsel for the um, applicant was present, the applicant was present, and essentially you had a, a, an adjudication uh, within uh, executive session where those issues were discussed. Um, we included those, uh, uh, those as exhibits uh, basically because we consider those to be, you know, the best evidence we had uh, on the subject um, rather than doing a, a summary of those, uh, of information contained in the exhibits. I, oh, rather than doing a summary in the 
in the body in, in of the, the body report. of the report. That is correct. And you, you did it as an exhibit Y. Basically, because it was the it was the best evidence rule, um, rather than summarizing what was in the reports and there being uh, multiple issues of hearsay attached to the report, and that and that those exhibits uh, obviously were made available to the board to review. Mr. Donahue, were, yes, were you present at that executive session? Yes, yes, as was Andy. Correct. With regard to uh, allegations um, uh, um, with Mr. Ali, uh, the staff had been unable to substantiate uh, that association, uh, and uh, Mr. DeNaples had denied under oath that he, uh, he knew Ali. Um, there may have been other substantiated uh, information that I, that I you know, cannot presently recall. Um, and that information was, was not included uh, in the report because uh, the determination was that it was unsubstantiated, uh, unsubstantiated evidence and uh, could not be included within the report and should not be recruited uh, in the report. The, no, BI, no BIE investigator was instructed by me um, not to try to obtain uh, additional uh, substantive ev evidence. Uh, in this connection, I must note that the agency attempted on uh, multiple occasions to obtain uh, information about Mr. DeNaples from law enforcement agencies. Uh, it was later revealed after the uh, license was issued uh, that there was uh, information uh, regarding uh, Mr. Ali and his connection to Mr. DeNaples um, that was not provided to us uh, despite our repeated requests. Um, and that information um, was later uh, substantiated that they had um, a relationship. Uh, and actually, that was the information that was used at a later date after licensing in which Mr. DeNaples was charged with perjury for lying to the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. Uh, but again, that information uh, was not made available to us until after uh, the, uh, the licensing decisions. If I could just interrupt you for sure. just a second, Mr. Dunning. We have proposed uh, an exhibit which is uh, a Philadelphia Inquirer article. It seems to be the paper of record in this case, uh, having to do with the, the uh, events that Mr. Donahue just testified about in more detail, and we'd offer that at this time uh, as a report for what it is, I guess is what I would say. So we have no objection. This is exhibit, uh, applicant exhibit number. This would be 20. 20. 20. Yeah. Do you have copies of that? Yes, I do. Mr. Mackey has that. And since I've interrupted you, could I go back to something that you said about the executive sessions and um, relating to uh, Commissioner Zanenga's question? Uh, what was it that happened in the executive session? What was the nature of the proceeding in the executive session? Um, so that, again, it was an adjudicatory uh, proceeding in which you had the board present. You would have had the uh, witness would have uh, presented testimony. BIE counsel would have been present and would have been able to cross-examine uh, the witness. Who was who was a B, who did the work for BA, the BIE? Uh, my so recollection it was predominantly Michael Schwer. Okay, and you identified him before as the uh, chief enforcement counsel. He was the chief enforcement counsel. That is correct. Okay. Um, all right. And those, of course, those executive sessions uh, were all transcribed. They were all made part of the formal record uh, upon which the board would ultimately make its decision. And the fact that they were conducted as executive sessions as opposed to public sessions, is, is that, was that a function of the Pennsylvania statute? Yes, yes. Okay. The, the Pennsylvania statute, in, in my interpretation, was rather clear that matters that were of a confidential nature had to be conducted in uh, executive session. Okay. So please continue. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, and just in the way of a headline here, this um, Philadelphia article, police left gaming board in dark, in the dark. State troopers did not pass on information on a casino owner charged with lying about ties to mob. Yeah, and the, the commissioners obviously can read this for themselves, but I think it probably bears just reading into the record the first two paragraphs of this article. Months before Lewis a. DeNaples received his casino license. The Pennsylvania State Police realized that he might have lied to gaming regulators but kept it secret, the police acknowledged yesterday. This is in February 2008, as uh, Mr. Dunning was testified after the uh, license had been issued. 
That decision meant that the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board was in the dark about the potential perjury when it voted in December 2006 to give the Naples a license to open a 412 million Poconos slots parlor. And then I just skip down, uh, I guess this is the fourth paragraph. In interviews, top current and former state police officials said the agency decided it could not share that evidence even though under a deal brokered by a judge, police had agreed to pass along any damaging information about the Naples. Okay, could you continue, uh, Mr. Donahue, there were some questions yesterday, I believe, about the, this uh, part of the uh, report, um, and in, in particular with respect to an attorney named uh, Nan D Davenport and communications you might have had with, with her. Could you tell us about that? Sure, and, and I think the report suggested that I ordered, uh, was at a meeting where I ordered uh, Davenport to uh, remove uh, information that myself and, and Ann needed. I have no recollection of, of meeting uh, directly with, with Nan um, and, and ordering her to remove information from the, from the report. Um, I note that uh, in the IAB's report on uh, page 279, uh, notes that the a grand jury uh, report is silent on whether um, PGCB director, uh, executive director Ann Neeb or myself uh, was asked about uh, meeting with Davenport. Um, the IEB report further notes at uh, 283 and 284 that I confirmed that I was uh, not asked about the, uh, the meeting. More detail on this uh, is contained in my uh, January 18th, uh, 2012 memo to Spectrum Gaming, in which uh, EIB, uh, which is EIB Exhibit 12. Uh, I never exerted uh, any uh, duress on Mrs. Uh, Davenport. The grand jury report, uh, therefore, therefore, does not contain you know my side of the story. The grand jury report, um, Exhibit 10, states that ultimately. Uh, Davenport made the requested changes because Schwer told her to. If um, I could just interrupt you for a sure. second. The, the memo that's Exhibit 12 that you just referred to, um, could you just tell us how you came to write that memo? Sure. It was during the course of uh, my uh, license application before the Ohio Casino Control Commission in which I uh, met with the um, investigators from Spectrum. Uh, they had a number of questions uh, regarding the testimony that I had gave before the uh, grand jury. Um, I gave them a memo in which I, of course, would not have had the benefit of my testimony because in Pennsylvania, a witness does not get a copy of the, their, their testimony. So I did my best uh, to recall what I testified to. Okay, and we'll, we'll come back briefly uh, about the uh, spectrum investigation in Ohio, but if you could continue telling us about uh, the meetings at the board concerning the report and uh, your interaction with Ms. Davenport. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, to be clear, um, I supported the modifications to the report. Uh, and I think I indicated uh, earlier there was a meeting that I recall, an internal meeting with a large group of people where it was discussed. Um, that the decisions were made uh, to include information in the report that was factual and could be substantiated. Uh, raw, unfiltered intelligence, rumor, unsubstantiated uh, information, in my opinion, and uh, in the opinion of my colleagues, uh, should not be a part of that, uh, that report. Um, on that, that particular point, I, I would draw your attention to the, uh, the grand jury report at uh, pages 43 and 44, um, in which um, Chairman Decker uh, expressed uh, essentially the same, the same opinion. Um, and again, you know, my uh, position under Pennsylvania law was that uh, adjudications uh, that the board would reach have to be supported by uh, facts and the substantial evidence. And, and Pennsylvania case law is, is very clear on that. While in some jurisdictions, uh, administrative agencies can make the, uh, decisions um, where the rules of evidence uh, are not as stringent, in Pennsylvania there are, there are limitations to those rules. And, um, uh, in Pennsylvania, under Pennsylvania case law, uh, adjudications must be supported by the substantial evidence. Okay, so there were um, some discussion of uh, modification to the report. Um, did you agree with those modifications, disagree? How did, how did you come out? Yeah, again, I, I agreed with the modifications. And, and, and to be clear, the, the information that was included as exhibits to the report um, and other information in the report was uh, fully vetted again uh, in executive session. 
My recollection is that it was just the Shams Ali uh, information that ultimately was, was not included. There could have been others, uh, but that my recollection, it was just the Shams Ali uh, information. So um, while there is discussion about, you know, revisions to the report and, and that sort of, it was just that one issue. Uh, there could have been others, but it was just that one issue that I can recall and ultimately um, that issue was the subject of a, of a perjury charge when the information was later developed um, about uh, Mr. Just Naples' relationship. There may be something here that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. The um, I you, you made, in, according to um, I guess the, the the investigative report, you made a strong uh, and in in other places you made a strong uh, point about what administrative law required in Philly and how you didn't want to muddy the waters of the case. I understood that you felt that beyond the rams and the truck, trucking uh, issues, that the rest of the material, the, the, the Crime Commission report uh, and the uh, jury, uh, the prior conviction, the uh, Dalia, the, the Shams Ali, whatever his name is, all that stuff uh, would not be helpful, that, that the report ought to be limited to the two issues. Did I misunderstand that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so at, at the end of the day, again, the report contained um, those two issues that you just discussed, RAM um, and the Kat Katrina trucks, but it also contained uh, other information such as the 1970s conviction uh, and, and other information that, again, was discussed and vetted before the board. Um, there was other information that was originally summarized in the report um, regarding, for exa example, um, the Crime Commission report. Um, the determination was rather than do a summary, go with the best evidence included as an exhibit, which was made available to the board for their review. And, um, and you had no problem with that part being, you didn't think that was muddying the waters? No. Okay, I misunderstood that. And when you say a decision was made, the decision was made how and by whom? Uh, my recollection, it was, it was a consensus uh, among the, uh, the, the group that was, that was in that room. Uh, I made uh, recommendations. Um, I mean, how people interpreted my recommendations related to that. Um, basically, I, I felt I was doing my job as chief counsel to make sure that there was not information included in the report that ultimately the board uh, might rely upon and then the Supreme Court overturn because it was not substantiated. Did you think there was any, um, was this merely a theoretical concern or do you think there was a real prospect that is? the board denied this license or it might be further litigation. Now, the, the counsel for uh, Mr. DeNaples, uh, John Donnelly, um, he had raised uh, several issues with regard to unsubstanti unsubstantiated evidence. Why would he want it out if it would give him reversible error? Well, because I would suspect that he would, uh, uh, his, his issue was he didn't have the ability to uh, essentially um, challenge the issues because it was like triple hearsay. Um, that was his position. He would also want to win, wouldn't he? I think he would. Yeah, that's right. He would want to. He would want to win. His, his first preference would be to win. His second preference would be have a, have a ground to take an appeal. Is it correct? Yeah. Probably. A, I, I have a question. Just in a second, Mr. Donahue. Um, uh, what about the? Uh, can you speak to the matter that investigators testified before the grand jury? that they were not allowed to try to verify information, that they were told no more interviews. Um, do you have knowledge of that? Do you have information regarding that testimony? Uh, not other than what, you know, reading the grand jury report, I don't think any of those allegations were made toward me, that I uh, essentially thwarted those, uh, those efforts. Um, I think that was uh, made regarding other people. Did, to your knowledge, when information which is very serious in nature, comes from uh, the investigative arm of the commission. Did anyone say, um, look, this is information we should try to verify. This is really significant. I mean, rather than, uh, maybe you don't have any knowledge of someone saying, no, don't, but did anyone say, let's try to verify this information? It's really uh, important if this were accurate. I, I, my recollection is that the investigators, the agents, were, were always attempting to do their best job to uh, attempt to verify that information. And I, Thank you. I think you've, you've I'm sorry. 
in a no, minute. I, I think you mentioned, just to follow up, earlier that there were some efforts made in particular with respect to obtaining information from other law enforcement agencies. Maybe you could just give us a little bit more detail yeah, so, on what that was. So when um, an applicant would apply uh, for a license in Pennsylvania, one of BIE's uh, standard uh, protocols was to send a letter to all law enforcement, um, the Attorney General's office, to state police, to the uh, feds, um, and would ask if they had any information in their possession which would uh, preclude uh, an individual from being licensed. Okay. Um, and, and just circling back to the point about the uh, uh, law in Pennsylvania about uh, in administrative agency determinations and what constitutes substantial evidence, we have uh, included as Exhibits 15 through 17 the pertinent statute uh, in Pennsylvania and uh, uh, two cases that fill out the, that what that standard was at the time in 2006. There's another case that's included as part of the uh, board's exhibits, the number of which escapes me at the moment. Okay. Uh, we won't we won't go into the, the panel can review those 15 to 17. Uh, could could you just talk generally, Mr. Donahue, about as as chief counsel uh, to the board? what your goal was with respect to the presentation of these uh, suitability reports, and in particular the Mount Airy report. Yeah, again, you know, I, I think staff's goal, my goal as uh, chief counsel to the agency was to make sure that there was an appropriate presentation uh, of the facts based upon the substantial evidence um, at, at issue. And um, yeah, that's what, uh, that's where we worked uh, towards. Okay. Uh, and now, uh, the eventual result was that uh, Mount Airy was granted the license. Correct. Right? And so Mr. DeNaples lawyers didn't take an appeal, but did somebody? Yes. Yes, there was um, Mr. DeNaples application would have been one um, among the at-large uh, casino licenses in, in Pennsylvania. I, f I believe there was um, about uh, four or five other applicants. Um, and I know at least Pocono Manor, one of those other applicants that was basically vying for a casino in the same region, filed an appeal to uh, Mr. De Naples' uh, award of a license. Okay. And that did that eventually end up in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? Yeah, yes. Uh, that um, that uh, actually the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, had original jurisdiction uh, in, oh, in, uh, yes, for any appeals for um, the board's licensing decisions. So it immediately went up and uh, they upheld the board's decision uh, in the Mount Airy case. All right. And that opinion is uh, Pen Exhibit 18 the, in the uh, uh, Pocono Manor appeal of the Mount Airy license. Yeah. Okay. Just in, in general, uh, Mr. Tony, you, um, could you just sum up what you've just told us uh, by way of uh, a summary of your efforts with respect to the suitability report? Sure. I, I mean, I, I can assure you. Um, that at the end of the day, the modifications were made for uh, the appropriate reasons. T to this day, I'm not aware of any reason um, which was, you know, improper or, or untoward. Um, again, the decisions that I um, were part of, that I was part of, um, was based on my read of, of Pennsylvania law and the evidence that was before us uh, at that time. Uh, you know, and I was just doing the, the best job that I could uh, that I could do. Okay, Mr. Dunny, there were a couple questions yesterday, I believe, uh, to Mr. Savage about uh, your role in the drafting of this Mount Airy suitability report. So let me just ask you straight up, did you play a prominent role in drafting the Mount Airy suitability report? Uh, no. Did, I, th I think you said that um, by the time uh, the suitability report got to you, it had been, it had gone through several drafts. I, I, What's I, your best I, re that I received draft 11, of, and I think there was a total of 12. And, and when you received a draft, in what uh, stage was the process? It was substantially complete. Okay. It was what? It, substantially complete. Yeah. Did, did you play a prominent role in editing the, the dozen or so drafts of that non area suitability? No, report? no. Again, I supported the decisions that were made with regard to the modifications uh, of that report. Okay. And now there were some questions yesterday also about your uh, January 18, 2012 memo to Spectrum Gaming. That's uh, the board's exhibit number 11. In particular, there was reference to uh, a paragraph on page 3. Uh, first, could you tell us how you came to prepare and provide this memorandum? 
Yeah, again, I was asked to uh, provide a memorandum by Spectrum Gaming uh, about the testimony that I gave before the grand jury. I think I stated before that I didn't have a copy of that testimony uh, in Pennsylvania. A witness uh, is not entitled to receive that. Uh, I think I actually, we, we actually asked if we could have it. Um, and um, we either asked or just did, um, I think we either asked or we examined the law in Pennsylvania as to whether a witness was entitled to that information. Um, and a witness is not. And so I just, you know, based on my best recollection of, of the information and testimony that I gave, I put the memo together. Okay, and, and so I think in particular what you, asked, you, you were asked about yesterday is the statement in the memo that it was your best recollection uh, that you told the grand jury you were reluctant to criticize another attorney's performance. Could you just give us some background uh, and context as to what that, that particular paragraph of your memo is about in that statement? Yeah, again, I was not uh, Mr. Schwoyer's uh, boss. Um, and, you know, I, I, I was not going to do a comparative analysis um, in, ter in terms of what um, uh, Mr. Schwer had done and, and whether I had, could have done a better job than, than Mr. Schwer. Why not? I mean, I, the, I, the, I was the one who asked the question, yeah. as you know. There was a misunderstanding that, that is non-trivial. I, I hadn't computed that, that the, the, the lawyer uh, was, didn't work for you. I thought that he did, and it wasn't until you reminded the Schwoyer relationship. So that, and that's, I get that there's a difference there. But I would certainly want our general counsel to tell us whatever she thought about the performance of, of any of our lawyers anywhere in the operation. And in a situation like this, you, there was, I mean, something happened. You, you made the judgment um, that you had a very strong case against this guy. You had every, it looks like, sounds like you had every expectation that he was not going to get the license. Um, and you were wrong. Something happened. Either your judgment wasn't very good, or the case that you supported being prepared wasn't very good, or it was poorly delivered, or you were grossly outlawed. Something happened. What happened? And when the grand jury was trying to figure out what happened, why would you not contribute? your analysis to that? I think Mr. Um, Mr. Donnelly, who uh, represented uh, Mr. DeNaples, did a, a substantial job of uh, refuting a number <coughs> of the issues that, that were raised. He did a, a very good job uh, of that. But you um, dealt with Mr. Donnelly, too. He didn't, pre he didn't change your mind. You had gone, there had been a series of negotiations with staff and Donnelly, and you ended up, staff ended up taking the strong position that you took. And, and again, he, he just did a very good job of, um, of um, dealing directly with those issues in, in executive session. Um, I also recall, for example, that there was a PennDOT um, employee who was there and was um, discussing the issues related to the retitling of the trucks. And uh, ultimately, uh, Mr. Donnelly got that employee uh, to admit uh, on uh, examination that the two forms that should be utilized when going through the retitling process, um, that they were confusing and that um, uh, one might use the form that uh, Mr. DeNaples people used when they retitled their truck as opposed to the, the appropriate one. And this, uh, was again, this was new information at the hearing? This was, no. this was information that was developed in executive session. So. Um, when the Katrina trucks issue was being discussed, uh, Mr. Donnelly got the, uh, ex the expert from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation to admit essentially that the forms were confusing. So you were, you were about lawyered pretty seriously. Mr. Donnelly did a nice job. I mean, this is a minor point in a way. I mean, I, 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 my thoughts about this are evolving, but you know, you've heard me say that in people, in, particularly in the positions that you're in, people that positions you in, somebody needs to make hard calls, and you are reluctant to be critical of Mr. Schwoyer. You're, you're mincing your words, you know, so as to not be critical of the performance of him or his staff or whatever. And you know, as a, as a characteristic um, in this context. That seems inappropriate to me. Well, I, I've been a managing attorney um, in, for, for most of my professional career. I am not afraid to make difficult calls. Uh, I made them when I was at the Attorney General's office. 
I made them when I was at the, uh, the PGCB. I, I make them today. I'm not reluctant to make uh, difficult calls at all. I think Mr. Schwer um, uh, did an adequate job. I think there were times where he was um, micromanaged issues, and uh, there's, there's some things that I would do uh, differently than Mr. Schwer did, um, you know, sitting in hindsight. But, Mr. Chairman, I can assure you, I, I can make difficult calls, and I, I, I do it regularly. Has there been an example, just out of curiosity, since you've been compliance officer, where you've had to go to your bosses and tell them something that they did not want to hear? Yes. Can you give us an example? Sure. Um, and, and of course, I don't, I don't think it would be, since it's an employment matter, it wouldn't be appropriate to get into names, but uh, I can recall an instance in which um, we had a compliance officer at one of our properties um, who had uh, made uh, certain allegations um, of, uh, of wrongdoing uh, uh, with regard to the management team. And um, I, um, the, uh, one of the senior vice presidents and, and our HR folks wanted to immediately terminate the individual because of some of the things that he had done. And uh, I, along with, uh, with Carl Sotosante, uh, I put the stops on it and I said, no, we've got to investigate this matter fully before we make any decision to terminate this particular uh, individual. Uh, we did that. We did a full investigation. Uh, I directly participated in that investigation. Uh, ultimately, uh, this employee's uh, allegations were, were uh, held to be uh, unfounded. Uh, and I did a report on that, and I uh, sent that report um, to, uh, I believe, Mr. Wilmot uh, and uh, uh, the senior vice president who was uh, dealing with the issue as well as the, uh, the HR director. And Mr. Wilmot wanted to fire this person right off the bat. Uh, it wasn't Mr. Wilmot. It was uh, the HR uh, folks and the, um, uh, the senior vice president. Who you, to whom you report? I don't report to them. They're, I so report that to Mr. Savage. That you were, I was saying, is there somebody that you report to? You had to say, bring a, bring a word to somebody you report to, yeah, tell I, them something they very much did not want to hear. I, I report to Mr. Savage, and uh, I report to the, the compliance committee. Uh, Mr. Savage and I, we, we regularly uh, engage in very, um, uh, at times, we have very good and, and uh, uh, good discussions about issues, and I'm not afraid to express my opinion at all. Is that this, the same would apply with respect to the uh, meetings and interactions with the members of the Compliance Committee? That, that absolutely. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, Mr. Uh, Donahue, why don't, you mentioned uh, I just have a moment. Yeah, okay. You mentioned earlier that uh, Spectrum Gaming was involved in conducting the investigation for the Ohio Casino Control Commission. This was back in uh, 2012. Right. Could you tell us uh, a little bit about that? It, by the way, that was after the grand jury report had been issued. That was the grand Correct. jury report was out there. Correct. Could you tell us about that? Uh, process that Spectrum Gaming used to investigate that matter? Sure. Again, throughout the investigative process, I, I was extremely cooperative with, uh, with them. I uh, met with them in person. Uh, I ended up providing them with uh, uh, two memos uh, in terms of follow-up conversations. I had telephone calls with them. And then uh, also uh, they asked that I give uh, sworn testimony uh, as to um, a number of questions that they had related to uh, my testimony before the grand jury and the licensing process, and again, I completely cooperated with that. And I think all of that information was made available both to Ohio uh, and, uh, and to this board. Okay, and then what was the, uh, I think you mentioned it before, but what again was the uh, result in Ohio? Uh, ultimately, the Ohio Casino Control Commission voted uh, in, in favor of my, uh, my license. Uh, I think in the Spectrum report, they said it was unhesitantly and without uh, question. Right, that's at uh, page 277 of the, uh, the Bureau's uh, report. And you are licensed elsewhere? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm licensed in, in nine jurisdictions. Okay, and uh, when you come up for renewal from time to time? Yeah, I was recently, well, I get renewed every year in Indiana. So, so yes, from time okay. to time I get renewed. So the renewals that come up where your, uh, your grand jury report, your name being mentioned in the grand jury report is out there. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. It's something that uh, I, I indicate on 
any one of the applications that I would file. Um, I, I put information in about my testimony that I provided uh, as a witness before the grand jury. Okay, and then you've you've, you've obviously reviewed the uh, the bureau's report in in this case, uh, reporting on the <coughs> work that Spectrum Gaming did in this matter in the, for the Massachusetts Commission, right? Mm -hmm. And what did the uh, Spectrum check your references like they checked all the other? individual qualifiers yes and what, and, and what did they conclude their conclusion was that uh, all of the references indicated uh, regarding um, myself is of the highest character and uh, integrity with no negative or derogatory issues noted uh, no derogatory information was developed which would preclude mr. Donahue from being licensed by the uh, Massachusetts Gaming Commission okay now I want to talk a little bit about there was uh, uh, some discussion yesterday uh, about your being the events surrounding your being hired by Penn. Could you tell us about your recollection of that process? Sure. I was I was uh, with uh, the Ballard Spar, Spar Law Firm and was contacted um, in the uh, spring of 2011 by Mr. Savage and uh, by uh, Mr. Sotosante. Um, they um, uh, expressed that uh, that Tom Oriyama was uh, moving on. Uh, it was uh, essentially retiring. And I had asked whether I was uh, interested in, in um, pursuing the position. Okay, and then what happened after that? Why don't you run us through that process? Who you sure, talked to? And sure, there was the I, I met uh, then with with Jordan um, uh, and uh, other members, uh, including. Uh, well, ultimately, I interviewed with uh, the CEO of the company, uh, Peter Carlino. I uh, interviewed with the uh, chief operating officer, uh, Tim Wilmont. Uh, I interviewed with the uh, chief financial officer, Bill Clifford the senior vice president of uh, HR, Gene Clark, uh, as well as uh, deputy uh, general counsel, uh, Carl Sotosante. Okay, how about uh, the uh, compliance committee? Did you have any contact, and you, you also mentioned Mr. Ariema who was retiring. Uh, did you have any contact with those folks? Yeah, shortly after uh, Jordan originally uh, discussed the issue with me, I met with uh, Tom uh, and had an interview with Tom, and then subsequently to that, I also had interviews with uh, Mr. Ducharme over the phone as well as Mr. Handler, who's uh, on the compliance committee. Okay, Mr. Ducharme again is. He's the, he's the, the chairman board. of the, he's the chairman of the compliance committee. Okay, and uh, in any of those discussions, uh, did the subject of the grand jury report come up? Uh, I remember uh, discussing those issues directly with uh, Jordan Savage, who was uh, again who had originally contacted me about those issues. Uh, I let him know that uh, I, I, I let him know that I was. Um, subpoenaed to uh, testify that I was a, had been a witness and that um, uh, a grand jury uh, report had been issued. I think I actually also forwarded the report uh, directly to him. Uh, I also recall him saying that he had discussed the issue with uh, Tom Oriyama. Okay. And uh, you also interviewed with uh, Mr. Oriyama. I think you may have said that. But yes. Recommend. Okay. Last topic I'd like to have you uh, talk about is if you could just give the Commission an overview of the compliance structure and process at Penn National Gaming. Sure. So again, I'm the Chief Compliance Officer. Um, I oversee all aspects of uh, compliance related to uh, Penn National Gaming. Uh, there, there are gaming businesses, our, our racing businesses, um, and I serve as the company's uh, primary, primary liaison with um, the regulatory authorities uh, in all jurisdictions in which um, PNGI operates. Um, it's part of my job, again, Chairman, I, I, I ask uh, hard questions, um, and I'm not afraid to, uh, to ask them at all. Um, the, uh, I've got a staff uh, internally uh, with a Deputy Co Chief Compliance Officer, a licensing analyst, and uh, an admin. And uh, we have property compliance officers uh, at uh, each one of our properties, I think with the exception in uh, in uh, Mississippi and, and maybe one, other two, one or two other jurisdictions where one compliance officer covers uh, the three properties there. Uh, that's something that we got uh, clearance uh, through the, the regulators and they were perfectly comfortable with that. I, again, I report to General Counsel uh, Savage uh, and the Compliance Committee. Um, the, co the compliance program, we, we have a number of uh, documents uh, that essentially is our charter, for example, our a compliance charter um, is uh, was set up, I, I think, uh, in, in early 2000 uh, and uh, outlines essentially what the compliance plan is uh, for Penn National. 
We also have a, uh, a code of conduct um, as well as a responsible uh, a gaming plan. A pen adheres to the uh, AGA code of conduct for responsible gaming, uh, which concerns problem gaming, underage gaming, unattended minors, responsible alcohol service, and uh, responsible advertising. Um, we also uh, obviously have uh, money anti uh, Title 31 anti money re, uh, money laundering programs at each one of our properties. Um, each property has a developed uh, a written uh, anti money laundering uh, compliance program that covers currency transactions and suspicious activity reports. Um, and uh, actually, one of the first things that I did when I when I got on board is uh, I developed a uh, foreign corrupt uh, practices uh, plan. Uh, that was ultimately inserted into our audit committee uh, charter and uh, speaks to um, uh, violations of uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and essentially how our, our executives are um, supposed to be governed by that, uh, by that act. Well, if I can interrupt you on, mm -hmm. on, that, on that point, uh, without getting into any, any confidential proprietary details of it, but was there uh, a uh, proposed uh, transaction in Asia uh, that you had input on, particularly with respect to FCPCA, FCPA concerns? Yes. Um, we had um, a development interest uh, in Asia, um, and we um, did quite a bit of due diligence um, on a number of the potential partners out there. We ended up hiring a, an outside uh, firm consultant that had experience uh, in uh, foreign matters. And uh, ultimately, they, they issued a report to us. I, I believe, actually, that report would have been provided to you um, during your, your compliance review of, of Penn. Uh, and ultimately, we did not enter into uh, the business with that uh, organization. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to ask you, but by way of follow-up, is you mentioned uh, that uh, responsible gaming matters and the various heads that you uh, ran through fall under your jurisdiction. Uh, have there been any employees who have been fired for violation of the uh, company's responsible gaming policies? have been terminated terminated um, none, that, none that I can think of off the, off the top of my okay. head let me uh, just to follow up on a, one other point that you made was the was the plans um, how about discipline for violation of responsible gaming uh, again it's the, it's just not unattended minors uh, over service at the properties oh 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 I, I got you yeah we have we have instances in which um, we'll have um, unattended minors or uh, individuals who are overserved, and as part of our responsible gaming program, um, it, we will often uh, the property will conduct investigations into those issues, and uh, often they result in terminations uh, if a person was uh, overserved or if you had un unintended minor type of issues. So yes, we regularly have disciplinary actions related to responsible gaming. Okay, and that is something that you direct and have input. Sure. Okay. You mentioned documents that uh, govern and provide guidance with respect to your compliance efforts, and just for the Commissioner's benefit, we've included the Compliance Review and Reporting Plan as our Exhibit 2, and the Code of Business Conduct as our Exhibit 3. Uh, and with reference to that uh, Exhibit 2, which I think you referred to as the uh, Compliance Committee Charter, could you mm -hmm. just briefly outline for us the Compliance Committee and how that operates at Penn National Gaming. Sure, again, Penn is very committed to uh, compliance issues. We have um, a compliance committee um, to which I report. Uh, our chairman is uh, Stephen Ducharme. Uh, Mr. Ducharme was the uh, former head of the Nevada uh, Gaming Control Board. Um, and another member uh, who's here today, and you'll hear from him, is uh, Mr. Uh, Ariyama. He's the former head of the New Jersey Division of Gaming Enforcement. Uh, I think between the two of them, they have 50, maybe 60 years of, of uh, gaming and law, for, law enforcement experience. Uh, they're a great resource for, for me. Uh, they're always uh, available, uh, either by email or, or by phone, and, and I call them frequently and, and uh, uh, see what their view is on, on particular issues related to compliance. Uh, we also have um, uh, two of our directors, one who had recently uh, retired, who uh, also serve on the Compliance Committee. Um, on a quarterly basis, I provide them with a, uh, a Compliance Committee report in which I uh, run through uh, you know, a series of um, uh, information for the Compliance Committee that um, uh, we report on. Um, and to just you know, give you a, a quick laundry list of uh, material transactions that the company's going through, such as uh, joint venture 
uh, projects, uh, development projects, uh, transactions with uh, suppliers. If we have vendors who are doing uh, more than $100,000 in business with either Penn directly or with one of our affiliates, we do a, a background check uh, on those uh, suppliers. That uh, all gets run up to the Compliance Committee. Um, when new directors are brought on board, um, that director uh, has to go through a, a, a compliance review and a background check. Uh, ultimately, the uh, compliance review that we've conducted will go up to the, uh, the Compliance Committee and they'll be informed uh, about the, the status of, a, of an incoming director. A material litigation, uh, compliance with laws, and then acts of wrongdoing. You know, if, we're, if we've gotten fined in a jurisdiction, for example, uh, an underage uh, person gets on the floor and we've re received a fine from a jurisdiction, I advise them to, as to all the material uh, issues that we face on a quarterly basis. Okay, you, you mentioned Mr. Ducharme as the chair of that committee, and he, he's the individual that we heard the report, the conversation with earlier from Director Wells. Right. And uh, it's for the commissioner's benefit, a biographical statement of his with respect to him is our Exhibit 14, uh, and also included in Exhibit 14 is a biographical statement from Mr. Ariyama, who you'll be hearing from later this afternoon. Um, let me ask you, with respect to the committee before we move on, uh, does the committee have meetings? Yeah, again, we meet on a quarterly basis. All right, and other than the members of the uh, uh, Compliance Committee, who usually attends those? You? I attend those. Um, Jordan Savage attends those. Our um, Chief Operating Officer, Tim Wilmot, attends the, the meetings, as does our internal audit Vice President, uh, Greg Hart, as well as uh, our Deputy uh, Compliance Officer, Jim Valdeci. Okay. And uh, just to give us some idea of the sorts of matters that fall within the Compliance Committee's review and jurisdiction, well, if you will. I, I think I went over some of that already. I mean, one of the, one of the things that we have is a, is a network hotline complaint where um, any employee, either from a corporate perspective or uh, from uh, any one of our properties, if they have an issue um, that they believe that violates, for example, the code of conduct the PIN has, they can file anonymously uh, a complaint. Uh, we receive that complaint through the compliance office, and then we essentially uh, initiate an investigation. Um, some of those uh, are complaints about uh, their boss, but uh, some of those are very serious complaints, and we run them down, we investigate them, and uh, there are numerous um, uh, resulting uh, employment actions as a result of those complaints. It, it's, a, it's a great system, and it works well. With respect to that uh, hotline and complaint process, has there ever been uh, anybody in the position of a general manager who has been terminated? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head a general manager, but again, there is numerous instances in which um, individuals um, at management levels and, uh, and, and above, you know, have been the result of, uh, of an investigation that was initiated through the hotline. Okay. And those are uh, decisions and investigations that um, occur through the compliance group? That's correct. Okay. Uh, last thing I wanted to ask you about is do you have any involvement with the uh, Board of Directors Audit Committee? Yeah, so I, I regularly attend the Audit Committee meetings, and um, I also, on uh, twice a year, will give the uh, Audit Committee um, a, a Code of Conduct uh, uh, review and essentially um, uh, inform them of, you know, significant thefts that we, that we have had uh, or any major Code of Conduct issues that would fall within the purview of the, of the Audit Committee. Um, for example, we did have uh, an issue at our Indiana property uh, in Lawrenceburg where our uh, surveillance director and um, his, uh, uh, one of his employees was uh, stealing from the company. Uh, ultimately, I think he stole uh, about $450,000 uh, by setting up a, a sham corporation and uh, purchasing a surveillance equipment uh, through, uh, through the company. And um, he was recently convicted uh, as soon as we found out about that. It was actually our internal control um, and audit section that uh, discovered it. We immediately turned it over to the Indiana State Police as well as the uh, gaming regulators in Indiana. Okay. And uh, what happened to his employment? Oh, he was, he was fired. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I, think, I think I covered anything else that you wanted to say uh, before we... 
turn the uh, mic over. No, to I, I no. I just want to again thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, I understand that uh, your need to be thorough and uh, and and cautious as you proceed, um, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mackey. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Donahue. Good afternoon. Uh, Minor matter, just to begin with, uh, Applicant Exhibit 7, which is the collection of uh, biographical information about various Penn National Officers. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. Uh, and your, your bio is on page 9. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just says the first sentence, Frank T. Donahue became Vice President, Regulatory Affairs and Chief Compliance Officer at Penn in July 2010. No, that's, I, that's a, uh, it was 2011. Okay, I, I take it that was a typo. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so you were, in July 2010, you were at Ballard Spar, correct? Okay. And you were performing uh, compliance functions for Penn National when you were at Ballard Spar? Uh, compliance functions, no, but um, legal counsel uh, on uh, some issues, yes. On an, on an outside counsel basis, yes. okay. Uh, I'm just gonna, I can ask you, uh, to face the commissioners just for the sake of the mic. I think you're getting lost. Oh, sorry. So uh, going to the grand jury report that's uh, gotten uh, quite a bit of attention in the last day or so, uh, Bureau Exhibit 10, do you have a copy in front of you? Hang on a minute. Yeah, there you go. Yep, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, Mr. DeNaples, uh, as an applicant, uh, at the time he, I shouldn't say he was applying, but he was the sole owner of an entity that was applying for a casino license in Pennsylvania, correct? Correct. Okay. And at the time he applied, he had a federal felony conviction on his record. Correct. And did you investigate the circumstances surrounding that federal felony conviction? Well, again, the Bureau of Investigations and Enforcement would have investigated that. Okay. Do you have an understanding about what the conviction was for? Uh, my recollection, it was for jury tampering. You're, you're, you're referring to the 1970s? Correct. Conviction? Yeah, it was yes. for jury tampering. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and again, my recollection is that that conviction was uh, fully developed in executive session before the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. Okay. Uh, my understanding is, and let me just, I, I have no firsthand non-hearsay evidence of this, that the conviction was actually for defrauding Lackawanna, Count, Lackawanna County in connection with a flood cleanup. Does that, that ring a bell? The, um, but I believe it was uh, ultimately the conviction was uh, a jury tampering related to. Related to yeah, that, yeah. correct. Okay. Yes. And uh, are, are you aware that it, uh, that, uh, Mr. De Naples, he, he was convicted for fraud in the underlying case, correct? Uh, I, uh, that could be, I, I don't recall specifically. Okay. But that other individuals were convicted of the jury tampering in a subsequent case? Uh, I, I don't recall. Okay. Uh, and do you recall whether one of those individuals who was uh, convicted of paying a bribe to a juror was associated with a known organized crime family? Um, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me draw your attention now to to the uh, grand jury report, okay. pages 64 and 65. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to go through very quickly some of the material that, that uh, was uh, edited in the, one of the last mm -hmm. versions of the report. Uh, again, though, in the context that you're dealing with an applicant with a federal felony conviction on his record, correct? Correct. In Pennsylvania, um, that was not a precluder. Um, if uh, 15 years had gone by since the date of the, uh, I think, the end of the conviction. Right. But fair to ins to say it wouldn't enhance his application. Would not enhance. I, I think that's fair. Okay. Uh, okay. Now on. Page 64 of the grand jury report, there's a reference to uh, some testimony before the grand jury from an individual named Greenbank. Okay. Do you see that it's in the, right before the block quote, there's a reference to Greenbank considered this information an area of interest. Mm -hmm. Who is Mr. Greenbank? He was the um, head investigator from our Philadelphia office. Okay. 
Uh, and there's a discussion about some uh, discrepancies in Mr. De Naples' interviews regarding his ownership of safe deposit boxes on that page. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And that material did not appear in the report, uh, as I understand it. I, I have no recollection one way or another as to whether it did. Okay. Uh, and do you have any recollect? Do you have any recollection about seeing in any form, in any draft of the report, or in any other way information about these safe deposit boxes? No recollection, of, uh, recollection about the safe deposit boxes. Okay. Uh, and it's your testimony that you were not involved in a decision to, to edit or remove material about the safety deposit boxes from the report? I, I, again, have no recollection about the safety deposit boxes. Okay. Now, on, on page 65 uh, of the grand jury report, there's a a summary of some of the edits that were made to the final draft of the report. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to draw your attention to the paragraph, the first paragraph beginning on page 65 at 11 a.m. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to read uh, just the, the sentence, the beginning, the original section four was approximately four pages long and included information from Pennsylvania Crime Commission reports, the results of an IRS PSP search warrant executed at the residence of Delia, De Naples' testimony regarding Delia and the search warrant, the exclusion of Delia by the New Jersey Division of Gaming Enforcement, Delia's indictment in May and October of 2006, and a meeting between the alleged kingpin of Philadelphia's Black Mafia, Sham Sud Din Ali, and De Naples. And my, my question to you, Mr. Donahue, is that consistent with your recollection of the, of the four pages of material about those connections? Uh, again, what I recall was the um, information about the Crime Commission report and the information about the search warrant. Those are the two items that I recall um, that were attached as uh, exhibits. As I said, there could have been others, but that's what I recall. Okay. Uh, and then the next sentence is, in the final version of the report, over onto page 66 now, section four was retitled, Other Sources of Information that Lame Lewis to Naples, and reads as follows. And then there's two sentences that follow. And if you could just review those two sentences and tell the commission whether that's your, uh, consistent with your memory of the way the final text of the report looked once it was issued to the commission. Again, my recollection in terms of the information that was included as an exhibit was the um, Pennsylvania Crime Commission report and the uh, affidavit. Right, and I, and I understand that much of the material reflected on the previous page was included as an exhibit. I guess what I'm asking is, is the material reflected at the top of page 66, is that consistent with what your recollection of what was in the body of the report? In terms of what was in the body of the report, yes. In terms of what was being summarized, for example, in terms of the summary of the, the Pennsylvania Crime Commission report. Yes, I'm talking about the body of the report. Yes. So there was summaries of this information, and again, the decision was made to um, include the Pennsylvania Crime Commission report as an exhibit, and to include the affidavit information as an exhibit, rather than summarizing that information. Um, because of the hearsay issues that it, that it developed, basically again, it was our, our best evidence rule. Okay. There may have been there may have been other information um, that was in, included um, as exhibits, um, and there may have been other information that was not included. That's again what I can remember. Okay. And you you described in your direct testimony uh, the choice to uh, remove some of this material as a consensus choice. Correct. Okay, but it would be fair to say, at least as reflected in the grand jury report, that the agents who did the investigation were very upset about the changes that were made. Um, again, I can't, um, in, in terms of the decisions that I made as chief counsel in those meetings, again, I supported those, I made those recommendations. Uh, how people interpreted those decisions, I don't know, but in terms of uh, agents being uh, upset about that. I, I don't remember that. Okay. Well, let me just ask you what the report says. Uh, the final paragraph beginning on page 66, 
uh, that first sentence, Green Bank and the case agent assigned to conduct the background investigation of Mount Airy were upset with the changes made just hours before the final report was submitted. Did I read that correctly? Yeah. Okay. And then on the page after that, page 67, uh, this is a discussion with Nan Davenport. Uh, and in the middle of page 67, after a question about, you know, the back and forth about what's going to be in the report, uh, she answers, yeah, we fought a little bit, especially BIE. BIE is the Bureau, mm -hmm. correct? They were very, very upset. Uh, did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. And again, the BIE, they did not report to me. They would have reported up to Dave Quaid, and Nan would have reported up to Mike Schwer. Now, I want, I want to look at, uh, spend some time on Bureau Exhibits 11 and 12, which were memoranda that, that you created following the issuance of the grand jury report. Uh, do, do you have Bureau Exhibit 11? I do. Frank? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and you testified earlier that this was a document that you prepared in connection with, uh, this was in connection with the Ohio uh, yes. due diligence investigation. Uh, and it was written, prepared by you, Mr. Donahue? Yes. Okay. Uh, to Mr. D. Giuseppe Spectrum. Correct. Okay. And then on the second page, I, I want to focus on the last paragraph on the second page. Uh, the sentence that begins, I testified, and again, this is, this is you recollecting your testimony before the grand mm -hmm. jury. I testified that Mr. De Naples' attorney, Mr. John Donnelly, had objected to several areas of a concern that were raised in the suitability report as being unsupported or based upon hearsay to which he had no ability to disprove or refute. Mm -hmm. uh, and I take it that those <coughs> several areas of concern being referenced there were the organized crime connections that that had been the subject of the discussion about what to edit from the main body of the report, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, now, in, would it be fair to say that your primary concern about much of those four pages would be the fact that that information about those organized crime uh, associations uh, were hearsay. Yes. Okay. And you would you would acknowledge for this commission that it's very often uh, a high burden for an investigative bureau to put together non-hearsay testimony about an individual's association with an organized crime figure. Well. Again, um, I, I know that the Bureau was doing the best that they could to pull information together that could be substantiated. But, but in order for you to be comfortable including it in the main body of the report, you wanted it to be admissible, non-hearsay evidence of these connections, we, correct? We, we wanted that to be substantiated evidence, correct. Okay. Uh, then on the next page of Exhibit 11, Uh, there is, uh, at the very top, a decision was made to remove information based on hearsay that could not be proven and to make reference to other information in their entirety as an exhibit to the suitability report. And I, and I take it that was a decision made by you and the executive director? Again, it's my recollection that um, through that internal meeting uh, when we met and discussed that, um, it was supported by me. It was supported by Ann. Um, my recollection, it was supported by others. Okay. And then the next paragraph down, the last sentence of that paragraph, and this is a, the, the last sentence of that next paragraph is, thus, under Pennsylvania administrative law, the board could not rely upon or make adjudicatory decisions based upon hearsay and or unsubstantiated evidence. Uh, and I take it that was your view of Pennsylvania law when you were involved in review of the suitability report? Correct. Okay. And that was your understanding of Pennsylvania law at the time you created this memo for Mr. D. Giuseppe? Uh, then uh, 
let's look at bureau exhibit uh, exhibit number 12. Could you just very briefly describe uh, describe what this memo is? Yeah, again, this was a memo that um, follow-up to the interview that I'd had with Spectrum. Uh, the bottom of the second page, uh, again, this is, is largely repeating a theme. Uh, bottom of the second page, you say before the footnote, I was concerned that the board's reliance upon unsubstantiated evidence and rumor could lead to reversible error by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court if the board denied the license based upon unsubstantiated evidence. And then in that regard, well-established Pennsylvania administrative case law requires that a board's decisions of an adjudicatory nature must be based upon the substantial evidence and not hearsay or rumor. Uh, did I read that correctly? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay, and again, that was your view at the time you wrote the memo. And there's a citation then to the Wintermeyer case, which uh, I'm presuming you added there because it supports the proposition that you, right. okay. Yeah, and, and I would also add um, the Pennsylvania Code um, to PACS 704, the a board's order must contain findings of fact and conclusions of law supported by credible, legally competent, substantial evidence. Okay, and, that, and that's exhibit 15 that, that your counsel yes. have put into the record today. Uh, So this standard that's identified in Exhibit 12, uh, the, the decision had to be based upon substantial evidence. Uh, you believed that that was the standard, that was the standard that you applied when you were assessing, when you were involved in the, in the assessment of the suit, suitability of Mr. DeNaples, correct? Again, as a Pennsylvania lawyer, my read on that statutory provision and Pennsylvania case law was that rules, I'm sorry, decisions of an adjudicatory nature have to be supported by the substantial evidence, okay. correct? And so just to put a, a finer point on it, if the board, if the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board had a substantial amount of uh, hearsay evidence about an applicant's organized crime connections, uh, it, it could not rely on it. Uh, it. It would not be able to rely on that for its decision. I'm sorry? If, if all a board had was a substantial amount of hearsay evidence about an applicant's organized crime connections, that would be insufficient for it to deem an applicant unsuitable. Yes. Again, in, in, in Pennsylvania, um, an adjudicatory decision made by an administrative agency has to be supported by the substantial evidence. Okay. I understand in some jurisdictions, um, that standard is um, not as high, but in Pennsylvania, the courts have regularly come back and said, um, while there's a uh, limited nature in terms of some of the hearsay or other evidentiary rules, uh, there's numerous cases where they've overturned administrative agency decisions based on that standard. Okay. Now, page 71 uh, of Exhibit 13, this is your sworn interview uh, in front of... Uh, uh, I believe, again, this is the, your sworn interview in connection with the Ohio due diligence proceeding. Is that correct? Yes. I'm sorry. It, what page? Uh, it's Exhibit 13, page 71. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're uh, asked a series of questions here about these issues that we've been discussing, the burden of proof and so mm -hmm. forth. And on line 20, uh, on page 71, you say, again, Pennsylvania administrative law is very clear that when a board is making a decision of an adjudicatory nature relating to the underlying rights or privileges in this instance, privileges related to an applicant due to adjudication, the board has to rely on what's in the record, has to rely on substantial evidence. So I believe these reports, in fact, reflected that. Uh, did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. So. Going back for a minute to the grand jury report, there was, you know, as we've talked about at length, uh, some significant criticism in the report about the manner in which the reports were edited at, at the end of the day. But there was a further critique of the Gaming Control Board's handling of the burden of proof in these suitability hearings. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Now. 
you would acknowledge that in these proceedings, and it's true of Massachusetts law as well, the applicant always has the burden of proof to demonstrate by clearing and clear and convincing evidence its suitability for a, a, a license. And that the, 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 the Bureau has no burden. It's the applicant's burden. I agree that, yes, it's the applicant's burden to uh, establish that by clear and convincing evidence. Okay. Well, on, on page 47 of the grand jury report, I just, I want to, in, in connection with the uh, report's review of this issue regarding the, its concerns about the way the burden of proof was applied, there was a, a reference to a statement made by a licensing attorney with significant experience in New Jersey, which I understand is a, a different jurisdiction and they may have different laws that are applicable. But uh, at the top of, third of the way down the page on page 47, I'll just read this. Uh, uh, on the issue of hearsay, a licensing attorney with significant experience in New Jersey explained, yes, I believe the hearsay does belong in a suitability report. I believe that it's a suitability report is to take into consideration the character of the individual. And if hearsay, you know, goes to that, then it's the burden of the applicant to refute that information. Now, would you agree with that statement or disagree with oh, that I, statement? I, I think you may have said it best. I mean, it was, it's a, a New Jersey attorney, not a Pennsylvania attorney. I was applying Pennsylvania law. Okay. Let's... Uh, if we could just look brief. Mr. Mackey, could I just interrupt for one second? Um, I would like to get a sense of the commission. Um, I have a little bit the feeling that we're beating a dead horse. Um, and if there is new stuff, um, I, I don't mean just you, I mean we, um, that we want to continue. Is there more to pursue? Or have we talked about these issues and Mr. Donahue? Um, Enough. I want to spend th three minutes with Mr. Dunne here. Okay. Um, and just, just, just to, to uh, make sure I understand. Okay. And and and. So okay. just, if just I, I have a couple additional questions. Okay. As well. I, I will conclude this line of testimony very quick. Okay. Quickly. Uh, and I. Uh, that's fine. Apologize for how long it's gone. Uh, applicant exhibits uh, exhibit 15. That's the the statute that reflects the general standard of proof in Pennsylvania. Uh, the, your counsel has put into the record. This is Title II, Subchapter 7, Subchapter A. And that's the, the statute you referenced before uh, with respect to the substantial evidence standard applying to a proceeding like this. Okay, and then uh, your counsel has also put into the record the Pocono case, and you were referencing the Pocono case uh, earlier today. Uh, and it's in the record, your exhibit uh, 18, 18. 18 uh, the bottom of page 8. And uh, the lower oh, right, hold on. He's still so getting there. the lower right hand corner of. He's still getting there. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Bottom of page eight. Did you yes, say? bottom of page eight. Uh, lower you. right hand corner, beginning at head note one. Okay. And then there's a citation there to the standard of review that applies in the uh, gaming context. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And it cites the statute, the provision of the gaming statute that provides that standard of review. Mm -hmm. And what it says is, notwithstanding the provisions of Title II Pennsylvania CS Chapter 7 Subchapter A, which is the statute that you are relying on, Exhibit 15, mm -hmm. The Supreme Court shall affirm all final orders, determinations, or decisions of the board involving the approval, issuance, denial, or conditioning of a slot machine license unless it shall find the board committed an error of law or that the order, determination, or decision of the board was arbitrary and there was a capricious disregard of the evidence. Did I read that correctly? Yes. So what Pocono, would you agree with me that what the Pocono decision is saying is that your Exhibit 15 and the statute cited therein does not apply in the gaming context? Could, can I just object, and maybe this is picking up on the Chair's point, we're now talking about 
a Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision that was decided after the events at issue. And might I just add, decided after the events at issue, but well before the witnesses quite clear, consistent, and repeated testimony justifying the approach taken in the uh, uh, Mount Airy suitability report. In 2006. An objection. Yeah, well, it's noted. Um, are, are you, have you finished your point? I, I finished my point. Uh, I, look, I, in, with, in connection with this burden of proof, uh, I have only looked at the material that you and your counsel have brought to the attention of the Commission through the exhibits and in your interview, but certainly based on the Pennsylvania Gaming Statute, which provides its own standard of review, based on the uh, Pocono Supreme Court decision uh, that describes what that standard of review is, there's certainly at least a position to be taken here that the substantial evidence test doesn't apply here. Again, my best professional judgment um, at the time as uh, chief counsel to the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board was that that um, adjudications um, that were entered into by the board had to be supported by the substantial evidence. Did anybody, presuming that you had many, many discussions with your legal colleagues uh, on the board during the period of time you were going through the suitability determination for Hunter. Did anybody uh, on the team, any of your legal colleagues, say, hey, let's take a step back here because there is this standard of review that applies specifically in the gaming context that maybe is the applicable standard of review? Uh, uh, actually, um, one of the deputies that I hired, a gentleman by the name of Doug Sherman, who uh, ultimately became the chief counsel to the, to the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board, uh, one of the best public attorneys I, I know. Uh, he completely agreed with my position, and we had many discussions on that. If you were in the position, and, and you, I, I presume you are in the position now, of uh, on occasion vetting the background of an employee with your compliance committee, there is a provision in your compliance committee charter that talks about uh, suitability determinations that sometimes do go to the, the compliance committee. Is that correct? Sure. Okay. What, how, if you were dealing with a situation, a Penn National employee, any employee, who uh, was working on the floor of one of your casinos, and you came into possession of information that was equivalent to the information on the four pages that were moved from the body of the report, uh, would you report that information to the compliance committee in connection with that person's employment? Sure, absolutely. Okay. The, the, the compliance committee would not be engaging in an adjudication. Okay. And it would be, so it would be appropriate then for your compliance committee to act on that information, correct? Sure. Okay. So your reading of Pennsylvania law is that the law would not protect Mr. DeNaples' employment if he were uh, dealing cards on the floor of your casino, but it would protect him if he were the sole owner of a company trying to get a lucrative casino license from the state of Pennsylvania. My, my reading of the law and in terms of the facts and circumstances at the time was, you know, I was exercising my best professional judgment. Okay. And, and, it, and there were others who were in agreement with Okay, me. and just a little bit closer to home, uh, standard of review for uh, Massachusetts key gaming officials and for licensure generally, same as is Pennsylvania, clear and convincing evidence, correct? As, as I'm not a Massachusetts lawyer, but I'll okay. take your, your word for okay. it. Okay, well, it, uh, if, if you're in my position, you're, you're advising the investigative bureau here, and uh, it turns out Mr. DeNaples has applied for a key gaming license. You're in possession of those four pages. Uh, do you re re report that information onto the commission? Again, I'm, I'm not a Massachusetts attorney. I, I don't know Massachusetts jurisprudence. Um, and so I, I think it would be unfair for me to opine on that. Okay. Mr. Chair, I, I, I guess I have to join no. him. I don't, He's I don't, not here applying for a position with the right. commission. I don't particularly disagree. I mean, I think, that, I mean, it's an interest. All right. Any, um, you finished? I'm concluded. Thank you. Okay. Any other, I mean, there are. Yeah, I have a few yes. questions for right. Mr. I, I've concluded the horse has no life. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few questions. <laughs> Mr. Donahue, yes. were there lessons learned from your experience as chief counsel, yes. things you may have done differently? Uh, absolutely. Hindsight. Could you just quickly outline 
some of those for me? I mean, look, uh, you know, when I, as I sit here today um, in your public forum, um, I read Pennsylvania law very strictly as it related to conducting matters in executive session. As, and as I recall, there was also sanctions associated with violating Pennsylvania's gaming control law as it related to dealing with confidential information. And if you publicly disclosed it, there were, there were sanctions. Um, you know, as I have, as I have um, grown professionally, um, I, um, I certainly would support changes to Pennsylvania's law dealing with uh, how matters are dealt with in a public forum. Okay. Thank you. As your uh, new topic, um, as your, uh, your present position, in your present position, compliance, mm -hmm. Vice President of Compliance, do you oversee the racing aspect uh, for Penn National as well, compliance from a, from a compliance with racing standpoint. and yes. the gaming side yes. of the house, correct? Yes. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, the racing uh, commission in Massachusetts was disbanded and we now have responsibility for racing. We've taken that responsibility very seriously and instituted um, regulatory reform, hired a director with, uh, with uh, tremendous cr credentials and is on the cutting edge of uh, racing reform. Um, instituted um, uh, accreditation for our judges and stewards. Just a number of um, a number of uh, reforms. Just wondering about Penn's position with racing. Uh, a number of tracks, for example, uh, for example, our standard bred track here has uh, voluntarily voluntarily entered into accreditation, which is certainly something we've worked with them and they've advocated for change with us. Could you just briefly give me an idea of Penn's position on accreditation and regulatory reform? Yeah, and, and uh, um, you know, we also have uh, Mr. Wilmont uh, here today and, and Mr. Carlino, and from an operational standpoint, uh, quite frankly, they may be better to, to talk about, you know, those racing-related issues. Um, you, you know, my, my dealings uh, both with um, uh, racing commissions and, and gaming commissions uh, throughout the jurisdictions that we that we have been in have been uh, very good. Um, but but from an operational standpoint, reform standpoint, probably Mr. Carlino or, or Mr. Wilmot would be. So you have no role in uh, in in you know whether it be safety, medication, any of those issues uh, with your tracks. It's not something you're. No, we have we have a we have a senior vice president at Penn um, for racing who deals with those issues. Okay. Um, last question mm -hmm. is, um, I was reviewing um, all of the compliance issues that are listed, mm -hmm. enumerated here in the report, and it struck me, and I, I'll, I'll be specific with you, I'm looking at pages 40 through um, through 51 in the report. And I just, I read over and over again, and this is in uh, numerous, um, numerous jurisdictions, so it crosses, it's not one facility, in other words, um, violations and fines for late paperwork. I mean, I have 20 some odd violations here for late paperwork and in a couple uh, others for failing to notify the regulator. And it just, it just seemed to me to be somewhat of a pattern, very different than, say, underage um, uh, gaming or, you know, drinking where, you know, there may be training issues. This looked to me to be a pattern uh, of just consistent paperwork. I'm just wondering about, uh, about those, the amount of fines for this particular violation. Yeah, and again, we have um, compliance officers at, at, uh, at most of our facilities. Um, we work to do our, our best, but um, we are a large operation. We have a lot of subsidiaries, and, and we do at times make uh, mistakes. Um, it's my job and the compliance officer's job uh, to, to make sure that we improve upon them, uh, that we're communicating um, those issues to the regulator, and I'm communicating those issues up to the, um, the uh, compliance committee. Um, failure to report is a very serious issue, and. Um, um, we, we don't go for that at Penn, and, and uh, we, get, uh, we get those corrected as, as soon as we can. So um, I can tell you that uh, I'll continue to do my best to, to work with our compliance officers to make sure those issues are addressed. Thank you. Mr. 
change your mind? Just a, a couple of quick questions. How was it that you came about being appointed interim executive director? The interim, so Ann Neeb, uh, who was the executive director, um, she had uh, left the office and um, they asked if I uh, would be the interim executive director. Um, and uh, shortly thereafter, I, I made the determination that I uh, wanted to try the private sector, so I let the board know that I was not interested in applying for the, the full-time executive uh, director position. And um, so they engaged in a, in a rather extensive search um, and uh, ended up um, uh, landing uh, Kevin O'Toole, uh, who, in my opinion, has done a wonderful job for the agency. So it was the control board that asked you to step in as yes. interim executive director? Yes. And then once Mr. O'Toole came on, um, uh, I stayed for another year uh, in capacity and, and basically helped Mr. O'Toole through the transition. And then, as I mentioned, um, helped with the uh, the uh, table games uh, regulations. Thank you. Anybody else? Redirect, recross, up, down, sideways? Maybe, well, let me just say. I, it's your I, horse, I, man. I, yeah, I, well, if it's dead, <laughs> if it's dead, I'm not going to beat it and I'm not going to stab it. So I get the sense that you don't want to hear any more about the uh, grand jury report. We may or may not, but it's your. It's All your right, I'll, I'll be I'll be quick. But just on the the, the last point of, of Commissioner Cameron's questions about uh, racing, I understand you testified that there is a senior VP who's in charge of that aspect. Uh, but are you uh, aware uh, that whether Penn has any code of conduct with respect to the racing side? Yes, of the business? We, yes, we do have a, a code of conduct that uh, I think Mr. Sotosante put together. Okay. Uh, all right. Then very quickly then on. The, do you have the uh, grand jury report? I, I'll, I'll follow very quickly up on uh, Mr. Mackey's questions about the grand jury report. Where? Uh, let's start at uh, page 47. I wonder, 47, 66, and 67. Uh, attorney Mackey asked you about some unidentified New Jersey uh, attorney, but immediately uh, thereafter, kind of skipped over a sentence I want to draw your attention to. Um, sorry, you're in the, I need the uh, grand jury report. Is, uh, what's the number? You've got it. Mm -hmm. 47. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Immediately after the uh, opinion expressed as by the, that anonymous New Jersey attorney, uh, you see where it says removal of hearsay information from the suitability reports was at the direction of Schwoyer. Okay. And Schwoyer, he's the chief enforcement counsel that we've been talking about before. Correct. Okay. And then 66, if you go to 66. Okay. Mr. Mackey asked you about, uh, danced around in various quotes from this page, but if you look at the first full paragraph after the sections of the report that he asked you about. Right. You see that there's a sentence there that says, Schwoyer testified that he had no recollection that Neeb and Donahue met with Davenport and ordered her to remove information from the suitability report. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and then if you skip over to the next page, at the top of that page, third line down, ultimately Davenport made the requested changes because Schwoyer told her to. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and then the last uh, point, I want, just to go down further really on the same point and then I will stop. Um, there's some question and answer um, from the, the grand jury proceedings. Uh, there's a paragraph over to the margins. Is A, yeah, we fought a little bit, especially BIE. They were very, very upset, and Mike Schwer talked to all of us and said, you know, we have to do this. You see that? Yes. Oh, that, I have no further questions. Thank you. No, no further questions. Thank you, right. Mr. Donahue. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Right. I appreciate it. All right, let's take a real quick break. Yep, try to make it five. Right. We will reconvene. All right.
think we're ready to go. All right, we'll reconvene. I think we're back to the applicant for your next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Albano again, good afternoon. Um, our next witness is Thomas Ariyama, who is the uh, a member of the Compliance Committee and a special consultant to Penn. He also has a prior employment history at, at Penn. Our plan here is a, a brief uh, testimony uh, by the witness, um, and I think that, wit that testimony uh, will allow the committee to assess whether, the commission to assess whether um, there are follow-up questions that uh, the witness can be helpful. So, sir, could you please uh, tell us your name and give us an overview of your experience in the gaming industry? Good afternoon, members of the commission. My name, as you know, is Thomas Ariema. I'm an attorney admitted in New Jersey and uh, also in the state of New York. Uh, I um, got my start in, the, in New Jersey as a uh, criminal uh, prosecutor, worked for the state of New Jersey for over 30 years, uh, mostly though in the regulatory field of, of gaming uh, uh, regulatory matters. I also spent about a year or so in private practice early in my career. But um, I was, as a young lawyer, very young lawyer, in the um, 1970s, I was part of a group of, of individuals that wrote the New Jersey Casino Control Act. Uh, I was essentially a day one employee of the New Jersey Casino Control Commission. In, in New Jersey, there are two agencies responsible for the regulation of, of gaming. I was a day one employee there, worked my way up to become the deputy director of their legal division. In 1986, I became one of the very few uh, employees to uh, work for both agencies. I transferred, was allowed to transfer to the Division of Game Enforcement, which is a law enforcement agency, has criminal, regulatory, and civil uh, responsibilities. Uh, I became its deputy director, was its longtime deputy director. The directors came, directors went, but I was the deputy director for, for many, many um, um, directors. Uh, ultimately, in 2002, the governor of New Jersey appointed me as the uh, director at the gubernatorial appointment, and I served four or five years until 2007. I am still the longest serving uh, director in the history of, of New Jersey Division of Gaming Enforcement. Uh, at that point, uh, I was eligible to retire, or had been eligible to retire for some period of time. Um, and uh, an opportunity at Penn National arose, and I uh, accepted a position as Vice President, uh, Chief Compliance Officer, moved from New Jersey to Pennsylvania, and served in the capacity of uh, Vice President, Chief Compliance Officer from March of 2007 until I retired at the end of July uh, 2011. Um, at that point, I was not expecting um, to, to work, uh, but uh, circumstances changed, and um, uh, Penn asked me to stay on. Um, uh, I think they saw some value uh, in me, and I, they asked me to be a member of their compliance committee, and I accepted that. They also asked me if I would be a special consultant because of my knowledge of gaming matters around the country. As they were engaging in a, a real estate investment trust transaction, they asked me if I would be of great assistance to them in doing presentations, both private and public, around the country. And I said that I that I would. And yesterday I was in Maine, and I was supposed to be in Maryland today, um, but I got redirected um, here uh, for this particular hearing. Um, I also, uh, while I do, well, I am partially retired. I, I do work. I also am the chairman of a compliance committee of Cadillac Jack Inc. They are a slot machine company uh, based in Georgia. I also sit on the compliance committee of Casino uh, Rama, which is uh, managed by Penn National. Ontario law requires that that entity have a uh, compliance committee, and I sit on that compliance committee. Uh, for two years, I was the um, uh, the chairman of the compliance committee for the Rebel Casino in Atlantic City. I was responsible for setting up that compliance committee, also setting up its audit committee, which I sat on, and its compensation committee. But that, that ended in, uh, in May of this year. So uh, that is, that is my, uh, my, my background. Uh, I am, as, as you know, a, uh, a lawyer. Would you tell the commission what your major uh, duties and accomplishments were during the uh, period from 2007 to 2011 at Penn? Okay. Prior to 2007, I, I mean, I knew of Penn National, but didn't know of them very well. They did not operate a, a casino in New Jersey, but I knew a few people who, um, who were at Penn National. And uh, 
Hippa National, you know, had grown quite dramatically um, from the 1990s. Uh, they were a small racetrack company, even though publicly traded. They were a small racetrack company, and they, they grew in the 1990s. They really started to grow in, in the early 2000s. They, they hired as their chief operating officer, Kevin DeSantis, who was a very well-respected gaming um, operator. Had, he had worked for many, many gaming companies at that point in time. They paid him um, uh, quite well uh, to advance the, uh, the gaming opportunities of Penn National, and, and he certainly did. Um, company grew. Uh, it, had, um, it had an individual doing compliance, um, a lower level uh, individual, lawyer, but a, a lower level um, individual. And I, and I just want to digress for a second here on compliance matters in the gaming field. Um, compliance committees, uh, compliance officers are relatively new to the gaming area. They started in Nevada in the 1990s. In fact, New Jersey didn't even require companies operating in New Jersey to have compliance committees until about 18 months ago, although many did on their own in a voluntary way. Um, but there has been an evolutionary process with respect to compliance committees and chief compliance officers, and that process really started to pick up steam in around 2006 and 2007. Um, I guess from, I don't want to put words into Penn's mouth, um, you can hear from, from Mr. Carlino with respect to, uh, to that, but uh, Penn clearly was looking to um, enhance uh, and refine their uh, compliance um, function uh, when they sought me out. Uh, they actually sought me out in 2006, but I wasn't quite ready to retire yet, and uh, I held them off for a little bit, and uh, then I did retire and join them in March 2007. Uh, they had on their compliance committee already Steve Descharm, who I've known for 25 or 30 years. Uh, he's the former chair, as you know, of the Nevada um, Gaming Control Board, a very re well-respected member of the, of the gaming community. Um, but Penn wanted to enhance the, uh, uh, the uh, operations of compliance. They hired me. Um, I did a survey, and it was clear uh, that Penn National, as a now major publicly traded gaming and racetrack company, uh, needed to uh, uh, enhance itself, bolster its staff. Um, while I didn't want to spend money unwisely, it was necessary to have a deputy chief compliance officer, a licensing coordinator. Ultimately, there was a second licensing coordinator. Uh, absolutely necessary, given the amount of uh, jurisdictions that Penn National operates in. I systematized uh, the way uh, reports uh, to the compliance committee were written. They are much more detailed uh, than they were previously, and Frank Donahue has uh, continued uh, with that, uh, that format of very detailed reports to the compliance committee. Um, also, uh, uh, I, I made it a, a, a mission of mine to attend uh, every audit committee uh, meeting of Penn National, and uh, as you heard from Mr. Donahue, the uh, Vice President of Internal Audit attends every compliance committee. Uh, you might say, well, isn't that a little redundant? Uh, and yes, it is. In a little respect, it, it is redundant, but it's a redundancy that I think is vital because it aids in the compliance function uh, around the country and, and ultimately assists Penn National um, in, um, in achieving its goals. Um, uh, so those, I think, are my general accomplishments. Based on your... Uh approximately 30 years of experience. Is there a, uh, such a thing in the gaming industry as a compliance culture? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, in, in this um, sense, um, every gaming company, whether it's Penn National or, or any of our competitors, wants to be compliant. Um, there's, uh, and there's many aspects of compliance. And I attend uh, gaming conferences, I speak at gaming conferences, and what we are concerned about as compliance professionals is that um, our companies not only vet the individuals we hire, especially in senior levels, uh, vet the companies that we are doing business with, and again, you heard from Mr. Donahue, the threshold that we use is $100,000 for vetting individuals and companies that we do business with as vendors. Other companies have a much higher threshold, $250,000, even $500,000, but we are at a lower threshold, and we think that's important. We're going to keep it at that threshold uh, because we think that uh, aids in, the, uh, in, in our compliance um, process. Um, but um, what we have done and, and, and what 
we seek to do is to professionalize compliance officers. Many companies, even today, do not have separate compliance officers. Many co gaming companies, their general counsel will double as uh, a compliance officer. Penn chose not to go down that road. Um, they gave me a separate vice president position and gave me full authority to do what um, I thought was necessary uh, to enhance the compliance function at Penn. And that compliance function also deals with all of the properties, both uh, gaming and racetrack properties uh, to a certain extent that Penn operates. Uh, we have to be concerned with complying with all of the internal controls that we have at these properties, with all the regulations that are imposed upon us by um, the various jurisdictions that we operate in. Um, now, as a public company, are there other watchdogs that Penn has to uh, address? There are numerous watchdogs um, that um, we have to be um, um, concerned about and, and, and attend to. Clearly, uh, the gaming and racing regulators, uh, they are always watching what we do. We report to them. We have an obligation to um, uh, make self-reports if there is a violation. And so many of the, uh, many of the um, uh, complaints that you might see around the country uh, uh, for whatever the violation is or have been self-reported. Some are not, but I would say the vast majority involve self-reporting by the company to the gaming regulators. That's our obligation. That would be our obligation here in Massachusetts. Um, if there is a minor on the casino floor, if there is some other issue um, and we become aware of it, as we should through our auditing process and our compliance process, we will report that um, um, to you without, um, without question. Um, but we must be very vigilant in, in um, complying with all of those regulations. You heard Mr. Donahue go through a litany of, of what we uh, do and, and how we operate with respect to our 24-7 hotline system, with respect to uh, responsible gaming, and whether we have ever disciplined individuals. I know you just put them on the spot. I had a little time to think back there. And yes, we have, we have disciplined and terminated individuals uh, for, for over-serving um, customers, uh, for failing as security guards to do their job with respect to keeping minors off the floor. Um, that is a firm commitment that we have. And you know we believe in progressive discipline. Um, so we, we obviously look at uh, the individual um, uh, before we make any, uh, uh, any decision. Um, but yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something taken very seriously by, by Penn National. And um, I don't know if Frank uh, uh, discussed it, but we do have also a corporate responsible gaming committee, um, which uh, meets periodically during the course of, of the year. Um, the senior executives of Penn attend that. Uh, Mr. Wilmot also um, attends that and is very active in it, and we discuss ways to improve uh, uh, in the area of responsible gaming. Um, sir, last question. Uh, there is an understandable interest in whether the culture at Penn supports or promotes the ability of people to ask the tough questions. Based on your experience at Penn, could you please provide us with your assessment of how the company does on that subject? Um, before I came to Penn National, again, I knew a few people at Penn National, but I have been in my 30-year career, I've been in the corporate offices of, of virtually every gaming company in the United States, virtually every um, slot manufacturing company, and I know how they, they operate. Um, it, can be very stiff, very formal, um, very rigid. Uh, I came to Penn, um, and I always heard Penn had a culture of being entrepreneurial, being open door, um, and that's something that I happen to like because that's the way I operated uh, my office as, as a regulator. When I got to Penn, it was crystal clear. Um, everybody was available to the compliance officer. Um, everyone is available to meet with or discuss issues that arise in the company. Uh, yes, we all have titles, uh, we all have a chain of command, but be that as it may, um, we are, as a company, a relatively modest corporate office where, and we're all bunched, we're not out in Vegas, we're in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, an interesting spot to be, but we, we have access uh, to, to anyone in that company. So if I wanted to walk into the door of Peter Carlino, I can walk into the door of Peter Carlino. If I want to walk in the door and talk to any 
issue about uh, with Tim Wilmot, I can do that. And I'll, I'll give you one example. And Mr. Wilmot doesn't know I'm going to uh, raise this today, but it uh, but it just shows you um, um, how you can speak to uh, a corporate officer and be free about it. And we have very frank discussions. I mean, um, and that's one of the beautiful things about Penn. There are very frank discussions um, about compliance, about business decisions, about what to do in a particular jurisdiction. Many of them I'm in, I, I am involved in, even even to this day, they seek my advice, especially on the real estate investment trust transaction. But somewhere around, it's probably 2008, might have been 2009, there was a general manager in one of our, one of our properties, I'm not going to name the jurisdiction, but there were numerous allegations, um, both by phone call and in writing, to regulators um, about this general manager. Theft, waste, fraud, mismanagement, corruption, all sorts of stuff. Um, I looked at the allegations and, and I came to the conclusion early on that this was probably a disgruntled former employee who's making these allegations. The regulators in that jurisdiction thought the same thing. They asked me what I was going to do about it. Um, they said, and I said to them, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do an investigation. I'll do it myself. Um, and I went to, and I said, uh, and I had to notify certain people. I notified the senior vice president of operations who had uh, jurisdiction over that um, casino. I also went to Tim Wilmot and said, I'm going to do this just so you're aware of what's going on. Here's, um, here's the allegations. I'm going to vet it thoroughly. Um, I don't believe it. And he says, well, I don't believe it either. I think, you know, this doesn't make sense to me. You're going to spend a lot of time and effort. You sure you want to do this? And I said, absolutely. I said, you don't have to do it if you don't think it's right. I said, look, um, Tim, this is absolutely necessary to do because we have to document this. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what I view my role as, as compliance officer. And Tim said, I agree with you. Go do it. And wherever the chips fall, they fall. I did an investigation, and as it turned out, and as I suspected, um, uh, it, uh, it, most of the allegations were patently untrue. Some were unsubstantiated. I came up with some recommendations for an improvement in internal controls, wrote a very lengthy, detailed 25-page report, which I shared with the Compliance Committee of Penn, the Audit Committee of Penn, um, the general manager at the property, the regulators, um, and everyone was satisfied. So if that's one example of our compliance culture and how you can discuss issues and deal with issues at Penn, um, that's one thing that I can offer to you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions on this one. Okay, just, just a couple briefly, uh, Mr. Oriyama. Uh, when uh, it sounds like you were you were involved in Mr. Donahue's hiring as your successor. Yes, correct? I was. Okay, and you had a conversation with Mr. Savitz about it. Yes. And uh, did did you did Mr. Savitz give you a copy of the grand jury report? Yes, I read the grand jury report as did I believe Mr. Ducharme. Uh, Mr. Ducharme and I talked about it. Mr. Savage and I talked about it. Um, I, I wasn't here yesterday for, for Mr. Savage's um, testimony. Um, one of the things he also did was he called the former chair of, um, of uh, the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board, Tad Decker, um, to ask about Frank, his work habits, his abilities um, as well, and if he thought he was an individual of good character, honesty, and integrity. And, and Mr. Decker gave him a very, very high rating. Uh, that, was, that was relayed to me back in 2011 by uh, by uh, Mr. Savage uh, as well. Okay. Uh, do, do you recall discussing the grand jury report with Mr. Donahue? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. I, I met with Mr. Donahue actually several times. I met with him one time. I think he got a little bored because I was with him for probably over three hours. Okay. Uh, did you do you recall asking? Uh, it was just a general conversation about the report. Or did you ask Mr. Donahue about some of the issues in the report as regards the? Uh, the, the placement of material and exhibits as opposed to the main body yeah. and the burden of proof yeah. and so uh, forth. Yeah, I did not go line by line with respect to the, um, to the report. Um, one of the things that struck me about the report, and you know, I've, I've heard everything that, that was said today, and I heard you know, Mr. Donahue's testimony, um, clearly there was an internal squabble <laughs> at, uh, at the staff level of the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board about, uh, about this report. Um, different people had 
different views. Um, not surprising to me. Uh, I had uh, many of those discussions over decades at the Division of Air Enforcement uh, as to what good should go into report, what should not go into report. Can we prove certain things? How do we strengthen the report? So clearly, um, there was an internal squabble, and that's how I viewed um, this whole episode with Mr. Donahue. Okay. Uh, you indicated to, when you were asked by Spectrum investigators about your reaction to yeah. the report, uh, and this is on, on page 283, it says you, you did not place significant weight on the report during Mr. Donahue's hiring process. Yeah. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, in this sense, um, I obviously considered the report. It's a report. It's not, a, not an indictment. It's not a presentment, which have, at least in New Jersey, have legal connotations. It's a report. Um, I know there are certain things in there. Um, I mentioned one, one of them I find ac absolutely laughable. But um, um, to me, um, I think there was undue weight by, by the grand jury on, on what seemingly is an internal squabble um, as to how to uh, write this report. Um, again, I don't, I don't know, never met Mr. S uh, Swear. Um, I know Mr. Donahue from about 2006 because he came to New Jersey when I was still a regulator and I met him at that point, so I've known him since, since then. But one of the things that, that um, if I were Mr. Swear, uh, I would have considered is Mr. John Donnelly, and you heard Mr. Donnelly, you mentioned John Donnelly. I've, again, I've known him for over 30 years. I've litigated against him. He is a very formidable attorney in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And um, if I were writing a report, I would want to make sure that everything in that report is going to stand up and I wasn't going to let him pick it apart. Okay. I, I have no further questions. When, uh, when, um, when all the people were, um, you were talking about the, the uh, hiring of Mr. Donahue, um, did anybody say, you know, I know Frank, he's a good guy, um, yeah. but, you know, there's a, you know, the papers are full of this right now, we just don't need this, why would we hire a guy that is in the middle of this controversy? Uh, we knew, obviously we knew about the grand jury report, uh, we knew about the newspaper articles, but at the end of the day, um, you have to make a decision with respect to good character, honesty, and integrity. Penn National pays me good money. They pay Steve Descharm good money, and they pay us good money for a reason. They expect that we have the talent, the experience, the knowledge to give them good advice. And when we're vetting, a, a, whether it's a director, a senior officer of the company, uh, we're predictive because we look at a situation and we have to say, are we going to embarrass the company if this individual is hired and not licensed? I mean, that's one of the first things that always comes to my mind. If we hire this person, um, is he or she not going to get licensed anywhere? That would be a, a critical mistake on my part or Steve Deschamps' part. So I always put on my old regulator hat and I say, what would I do as a regulator if I were still in New Jersey? Would Frank Donahue get a license? What would I recommend? My answer to myself was he would get a license, and I advised Jordan Savage and Steve Deschamps did the same thing. Frank Donnie will get licenses wherever he has to apply, and he has nine licenses at, at this point in time. And with all due respect, I, I hope you also see it that way because I think he's done an excellent job in the two years that uh, he has been Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Chief Compliance Officer for Penn. It all depends on the condition of that horse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. Royella. If I may, uh, we did hear from a uh, witness mentioned Mr. Tad Decker, who's also identified on that organization chart uh, that you uh, received during Mr. Donahue's testimony. Mr. Decker uh, contacted us. He's now in private practice in Pennsylvania. He's given us his contact information that I have, we have today, and, and offered that if the commission wishes to speak with him about the contact he's had, he is more than uh, receptive to that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Mr. Carlino. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Mr. Carlino, I think it would be helpful uh, for you to um, <coughs> fill the commission in on your background and on the company background. I know that's somewhat of a broad question, but I think that would be helpful for them if you don't mind. If, um, if you've got the time, I certainly have a desire to share that. Um, I am Peter Carlino, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of uh, Penn National. Uh, and I have been Chairman of this company, to my great horror, uh, I can tell you for 41, wow. 42 years. Long time. Uh, going back to its founding uh, as a little Penn National race course in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was President in 1972 when, when we opened. I was Chairman by 74. And I pretty much remained chairman all my life, although there was a, a hiatus of about 12 or 13 years where I w was not an executive chairman, was often building houses, doing other things, but returned to take the company public in 1994 in what I thought was going to be a lark, a part-time job, just to solve some family and estate issues. Uh, the president was up in Harrisburg. I was happily in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, and I thought this would just be kind of fun. But we have today um, become the largest regional gaming operator in the United States with um, 28 facilities in 18 different jurisdictions and by an amazing alchemy have also become the largest operator of parimutuel racing in the United States, which by kismet leads us to be here now um, looking at Plain Ridge because it's right, right at the heart of what we do. Um, I, I might know, because a lot of this conversation clearly gets to probity, uh, and that's a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and I want to make real clear that everything that I have done, um, and if I've done anything, frankly, it has been to hire the best of the best. I'll say it categorically, Penn National is the greatest gaming company in the United States, not quite the largest. There's some Las Vegas-based uh, uh, operations, MGM, Harris, of course, that from the point of view of scale, but there is nobody uh, who has achieved what we have uh, over the last 20 years, and there's nobody who does it better. We're, we are in most states, and I, you can pick up phones, and I trust you'll do that, and find that we are the gold standard for probity in just about every place where we do business. Um, the, um, and that process started, it starts with people, with people. Uh, back at the time, by the way, that Steve Snyder joined us, um, I had a search firm, found Steve, uh, looking for a finance guy, which clearly was his background. We weren't a gaming company, we were a small racing company. Uh, and we put gaming in our name, in our IPO in 1994, because I don't know, stuff was going on somewhere. Uh, it probably took me 20 years to realize that we were in a gaming business, that is, in the racing business. I thought it was a sport. Uh, but it's a sport upon which people wagered. And it kind of light bulb went off one day and said, wow, there's gambling going on here. And through the early 90s, you might recall, uh, the, the world of gaming opened in various states and, and states were looking for new revenue. And I sort of had this notion in 1994, we went public and put Penn National Gaming, but make no mistake, we were a little racetrack in Harrisburg doing you know, maybe $38 million of business. And only that because we had just opened a couple of off-track facilities, which were quite lovely, but they had boosted the business and upon that we could do a little IPO, initial public offering, which raised all of $16 million. That's it, that was the total IPO. And that would have put a paper value in the company of about $40 million. When we had our sale to Fortress, which some of you may know something about, that cratered in the collapse of 07 and so forth, we sold the company for over $9 billion. So we were able to achieve some very significant things along the way. But key to that is this. As we bought our first gaming property, and, and those properties were in Mississippi, um, Way back when we were really too small to justify it, I looked around to see what we could do. How do we get gaming leadership? I didn't have a clue. I mean, I knew what a slot machine was. I'm not a gambler. Still, I'm not a gambler. Um, we were very, very, very fortunate to find Kevin DeSanctis uh, at that time. Kevin, who had started with the New Jersey State Police, I mean, literally on patrols, 
up and down the turnpike and then went into regulation and then, frankly, his career rose working for such folks as Steve Wynn, Donald Trump, and Saul Kirsner. He used to tell Kevin he should pay me after he worked for those guys to, because working for me was a lot more fun and a lot easier to do. But Kevin came with a regulator's state of mind. He did. Uh, he was a killer in that area. Uh, he brought great disciplines, which is precisely what I hired him to do, and set us off on a path that led us to um, where we've evolved today. One of the early things we did with Kevin is we started to look at this whole compliance question, and this is maybe off what I really planned to talk about, but having listened to the discussion, <coughs> I think it might be germane, was to hire Steve Ducharme, former head of the Nevada Caming Commission. For me, it was, how do we get the best of the best? How do we get somebody beyond criticism, somebody highly skilled, highly experienced, who knows what we don't know and can bring probity to this process for us? So Steve was a great early uh, effort, and he remains with us to this day. Uh, you know about Tom Oriyama, probably the best recognized and toughest in his time gaming regulator in the United States. So when Tom retired, he, fortunately not for too long, uh, it was a thrill and a tremendous coup and achievement for Penn to grab this guy and get him to come with us and to take and do the things that he's kind of outlined for you and, and, and bring it to Penn National, which he did. Um, so I, that's a little segue around that issue, but I want to make it real clear. This starts at the top. It starts with me. But in the end, it's about good people. Look, we're not perfect. You'll see write-ups for this and that, and there are some states who get amusement, frankly, out of finding companies for the most absurd things, sometimes serious things. Uh, it always kills me that you can get fined for self-reported stuff. You find something, and oh, by the way, here it is, and you get spanked. But it's all part of the process. I don't care how hard you try, you're never going to keep every miner off the floor. Does any responsible gaming company want kids on a floor? Of course not. But does it happen occasionally? Yes. So I, I'd like to think that how companies should be judged is between what happens to them and what they do. What's the response? And I think you'll find as you look around the United States that Penn is well admired for who we are and what we do. Along the way, just as a little commercial, I think we were seven times on the Forbes, uh, four, uh, for, Forbes um, or the, uh, excuse me, the fortune list of the fastest growing companies in the United States. By the way, nobody, nobody, not Google and anybody has achieved that uh, then or since, which is a, an amazing distinction. But in the end, it's, building, it's about building a quality company. I, I'm excited about the Plain Ridge opportunity because it is in the sweet spot of what we do. Now look, we've, we've opened more casinos over the last four years than any other com company in America. And these are not little places. Our facility in Kansas City, Kansas, is spectacular. It's a 400 plus million dollar facility. It's dazzling, it's wonderful. And I won't go into commercial about how we've taken one of the brands we bought some years ago, Hollywood, and, and, and taken it to a, a new level. Uh, we've opened a, a spectacular urban facility in Toledo. Talk to the mayor there. They love us, and they should, because we've done wonderful things. Columbus, and so it goes. We're building two new, brand new racetracks with slot machines in Ohio. They're under construction today. Nobody does more of that on either side, not more casinos, not more racetracks than we. And I'll talk a little bit about racing, because we haven't lost that focus. I mean, that's where I spent the bulk of my life, uh, running racetracks. And I do say with a straight face to folks that, that Slot machines, in a perverse way, are a very green activity. Because when you go to a racetrack, any racetrack in America, and you start driving a couple of miles around, and you see uh, white fences and, and you know, green fields and little four-legged things running around, it's because that racetrack is there. And the multiplier effect from racing in communities, if you remember in Pennsylvania, I can speak to it plainly, the, the, the racetracks are part and regulated by the Department of Agriculture because in the end we are an agricultural business. Um, and, and that's something worth remembering. Preserving green space, preserving our racing heritage, preserving this is, is phenomenally important. Some states, most states get that. There have been a handful uh, that, that don't, that have neglected their racetracks and, and kind of let them go by the board, which is an incredible tragedy. But most places have figured out that these places are important, often part of a heritage that's been there for many, many years. So that um, 
uh, we could, I could point you in a dozen places where we have transformed communities. Probably the most successful in the United States is Charlestown in West Virginia, where they had lost a referendum to put slot machines at this racetrack that it's been there since 1933. We bought it, they were losing millions a year. I was very clever because when I bought it, we lost millions more. But we, <laughs> but we persuaded the voters, they were the largest employers in Jefferson County, West Virginia, that, that this was important. They had lost their referendum before. I made that case personally, I lived there. I ran a political campaign there, I'd never done that before. And we won in a landslide. And in the years since, since then, which was the mid-90s, to this very day, that facility has grown to be probably the largest racetrack with slots, well, it is, in, in, in the United States. Hugely powerful, revenues growing a to a half a billion dollars from a little decrepit racetrack. Racing is utterly booming there, but more critically, the impact on Jefferson County, you know, there's a general thought, you build a racetrack, they're gonna steal all the, restaurants are gonna close, crime is gonna rise, prostitution, that's always my favorite one. I say I'm still looking for her. Um, you know, it's all this silly kinds of stuff. It is a business. It has had a profoundly positive effect. And by the way, anybody who wants to call the Chamber of Commerce in Charlestown, West Virginia, the chief of police to talk about crime, there's more crime in your local shopping mall than there is if you look at the demographics of these facilities. So that um, the positive impact, the hotels that have been built, the restaurants and so forth, it's phenomenal. So that's a brief case for why uh, racetracks or slots make sense. But let me give you just a couple of statistics that might be helpful. Um, and, and speak to Penn's racing background, and then I'll answer anything you might have to say. Penn has always been an innovator in that area. In my era, Penn pioneered year-round thoroughbred racing, and we do that still to this day. We operated the first telephone wagering accounts in the United States. We were the first racetrack ever in America, in fact, in the world, to put live racing up on a satellite back in the early 80s. No one had ever done it before. Uh, we've built and successfully opened off-track wagering facilities that are upscale, that have done phenomenal, uh, uh, provided phenomenal support for our racing operations. And we have successfully integrated racing and gaming. The chairman, sadly now deceased, of the Pennsylvania Racing Commission, Fitz Dixon, asked me to, to, to not neglect racing at Penn National. We did the unprecedented thing, nobody else did it in the state, of tearing down the racetrack that I helped build in 1972 and built from scratch an integrated facility, which is a standard for the United States it, at Penn National in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So we didn't neglect racing, we integrated it with gaming. Um, Oh, goodness. Um, we are the largest operator of paramutual facilities in the United States. Uh, we have facilities in 11 jurisdictions. We conducted over 1,100 live races last year in 2012. Thoroughbred, standard bred, quarter horse, and we even have a little tiny bit of greyhound down in Florida. Uh, over $1 billion of wagering through our facilities. Um, and. Penn National has been recognized by the industry in Blood Horse Magazine, terrific article recently about Penn National and what we've done to innovate. A few more points and then I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, we introduced last year at Charlestown, uh, and again, because of slot machines, the $1.5 million grade two Charlestown Classic, which is the richest race in North America for older horses. This is a tiny little racetrack in Char Charlestown, West Virginia. We've been able to do that. Uh, we've set new rake, wagering records there for three consecutive years, annual uh, wagering records in 2011 and 2012. At Penn National itself, we began with the, we just opened the inaugural $500,000 Penn Mile uh, and established, by the way, in all the years we've been in business, a new single day record just this year at Penn National. Highest handles ever wagered. At H Sam Houston. Uh, the $400,000 Houston Ladies Classic in, in Texas, of course, the richest horse race in the state of Texas. I could go on with the $2 million New Mexico Breeders' Championship and, and so on. So uh, if I leave you a sense, this, we are a dynamic, focused company that is both um, the best of the best on the gaming side, 
but still doing one heck of a good job on the racing side. We have not neglected our heritage. And with that, I, I'll be quiet. It's hard for me to do, but I'll be quiet. You all right? I have no further questions. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mackey? Okay. Good question. Yeah. So. Just a few. Mr. Yes, Carlino. indeed. Go ahead. Uh, let, me, let me start back in, in 1997. Uh, Mr. Uh, Snyder had the opportunity to testify yesterday, and he was talking about his, the beginning of his association with right. Penn National. And uh, as he testified, he uh, uh, had conversations directly with you uh, about his coming on board, I think originally as a consultant and then ultimately as a as a full-time employee of the company. Would that be correct? He, he dealt directly with you? Yes. Oh, yeah. At that time, exclusively with me. Yes. Okay. And, th and that was in 1997, thereabouts? Close enough. Okay. Uh, and then at some point, uh, as I understand the chronology, in 1998, he became, even though he's still outside, he, he got the title uh, Vice President of Development, uh, or, or, or words to that effect. Uh, and then uh, in 2000, you became a full-time employee. Does, does that sound right? Those dates sound okay. approximately right. I, I think I'm I've, sure I've captured enough. the essence of it. Yes. So were you, were you aware, Mr. Carlino, that when you brought him on board as a consultant in 1997 that he had some significant legal issues going with the SEC at that point? Um, I realized he had legal issues going on. How significant at the time, we weren't sure. But yes, he... he we found Steve, which he only recently reminded me, through a recruiting firm. Uh, he was from the Reading area, so it was kind of ideal. Reading, why missing Pennsylvania? He's from that area, mm -hmm. sort of a whole hometown guy. Um, had a terrific uh, background, but I, I do recall that early on, at, I'm sure at the initial interview, he said, um, but there is this issue that I'm in the middle of, which he did disclose. Do you recall if he disclosed to you that he'd been deposed on a couple of occasions by the SEC? Boy. At, at, understanding this is quite some time ago. At but. that time, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I knew he had an issue, but h how that was manifest at the time, I, I don't and know. Did, you, did he disclose to you at that point that his problems with the SEC had caused him to dissolve the financial consulting firm that he had set up, advising municipalities and the like? I, I only vaguely know he had a partner, I think he did, uh, and that that, it was, I, I can't recall. I mean, I really don't remember okay. that. Uh, at some point, uh, we're, uh, I'm going to make reference to Bureau Exhibit 4 just to kind of set a date and time. Uh, on April 23rd, 1998, the SEC instituted a, a formal uh, in investigatory proceeding against Mr. Snyder. Did, did you become aware of that at the time? Um, I, I'm, the answer is I can't recall, but I'm sure I must. Let's assume that I was aware that this was an ongoing issue. Okay. Did you recall if he, he told you about it or how you learned I'm sure it? he did Okay. would have. Did, did you read the administrative charge? Um, I suspect that I did uh, because, I mean, clearly we needed to understand what that issue was. And, um, and, and subsequently, we did look very hard at that. But you'll lead me where you want to go around yeah. that issue. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So uh, I won't volunteer. Let me just ask you this. When the, were you aware, uh, as Mr. Snyder testified yesterday, that the, the filing of the administrative charge caused him to resign from the state tuition account? program advisory board. I, I have no recollection of that at all. Uh, then, okay, so initially a consultant and then outside but with the title of uh, vice president for development then hired as an employee at 2000. Right. Okay. Uh, and then he left the company as I understand it in 2001. I, I believe that was his testimony yesterday. Right. Uh, now, when he was hired in 2000 as a full-time employee, do you recall, uh, did, did you make that decision to bring him on board full-time? I did. Okay. And w with the board. I mean, we are a public company, and that would, would have been a board decision as well. And, they, and, and all the issues surrounding that would have been discussed with the board at that time. Okay. Now, do you recall at the time he was brought on as a full-time employee, vice president of development 2000, 
further review of the pending matter with the SEC? Um, yeah, I mean, <sighs> lawyers hate this. Forgive me, but you know, uh, let me let me jump to where you want to go. I know we should let's just get right at that. That's fine. I might jump um, back, but and you can jump anywhere you want. Yeah. But I, I, you know, let's 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 answer that question because I, mean, I get it from the tenor of questions asked before. I mean, what pro, what do we do to examine this issue? What do we know about it? How do we consider it, and so forth? Um, the issue at the time was yield burning. Now I didn't have any notion at all, and I'm sure most of us here had no idea of what this yield burning thing was. Steve said he had this issue. Uh, he, I'm sure, told me at the time what the SEC was wanting to get this issue settled. You know, I'm scratching my head. Maybe, and I can't even tell you that was the case, but maybe that's why we carried on as a consultant, and I'm only surmising that because I don't remember. While we sort of examined this issue, and Steve, you may have to correct me later, uh, but while we examined this issue and decided, is it a big issue, is it a little issue, does it matter, does it not? Um, I went to our then law firm, uh, Meseroff Gelman, and they've since merged with, or years back, with Boward Spar, and I asked them, what is this stuff? What does it mean? Uh, and I know along the way we talked with, um, uh, with Al Dandridge, a former SEC lawyer who was then on the staff uh, at Mezeroff. And now, by the way, I understand the uh, ch chancellor-elect of the Philadelphia Bar Association. He he's a much esteemed guy. Talked to Al and the firm and said, what is this? Does it matter? Is it serious? And I'll give you now what my, my understanding of the issue was. You, you all know that it was an industry practice. It wasn't just Steve's company or Steve. It was what the whole industry was doing to, and I, it's over my head, but the, to, to price uh, these bonds uh, in a manner that was competitive, but apparently, and later, because it had been going on for quite a while, the federal government decided we don't like this practice. So they, they, they instituted um, uh, lawsuits against every major firm. I mean, we, we found this out, you know that perfectly well, uh, in the United States, everybody. Now, my sense of this was that Steve had the grave misfortune to have left his company uh, before this issue came to the fore. And he was left kind of high and dry, whereas virtually everybody else in America covered by this, and there were lots, were covered by the 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 settlements of their companies for their employees, the fines were paid by the companies, and so on and so forth. And so Steve was alone. The critical issue, as I recall, and I, and I, I have not talked to Steve much about this at all. I asked him this morning, just because I figured you asked me this question. The principal issue in Steve's mind was their requirement that he admit wrongdoing. And quite candidly, to his credit, and I'll stand on that to this very day because we fought to get Steve back, um, he would not admit wrongdoing. He would not admit willful uh, wrongdoing uh, because he didn't commit it, didn't feel that he had, he had done what was appropriate, and he wasn't going to do that. And, and by the way, I got to say, I think if, if you believe that and you're willing to stand up for that, uh, then you do what you do. So um, after talking to Mr. Dandridge, the, the Mezeroff people, and so forth, basically they said, look, this is, this is my loose paraphrase. This isn't the coolest thing that could be happening right now, but it was an industry issue, a fairly complex one, and we think you're okay to, to go ahead and hire this guy. We can't find any evidence of crime or misdeed or so on and so <laughs> forth. And that was a fairly exhaustive process, and I don't, it went on over a fairly long period of time. So yes, it, it ultimately came to me. We reached that conclusion, I'm sure, although I can't recall precisely, the board would have reached that conclusion, and we said, yes, let's hire Steve, bring him on. To the, go ahead. Uh, no, well, I was just, uh, in, in that, what you're, you're describing there is the process in 2000 when he was brought on as a full-time employee. Yes. Okay. So the SEC pen charges are pending at that point. Yeah. Uh, then uh, in March 2001, he left the company. Yep, uh, he did. And, and it was uh, uh, 
Was that a decision that you made that, that you had to part ways? No, it's much worse than that. Um, it, was, it was a decision forced on us by our acquisition of the Carnival um, uh, gaming assets, uh, which were essentially two assets. Carnival Cruise Lines had a, an interest in this company, but it was, run, it was a Miami-based business that owned the casino that we've happily owned for many years in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and a very interesting contract to run the largest destination casino resort in Canada, which we still run to this day, by the way, uh, Casino Rama. There was a particular regulator there, their top cop, if you will, uh, who saw this issue um, and, and maybe not unreasonably said, well, how about it? We don't, I don't like this. But he said to me, came to my office and said, look, we'll approve you guys, but this guy, Steve, has got to go. He's got to go and whatever it was, 15 days, 30 days, he's gone. I said, well, but, 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 and he said, I mean gone. And you can't talk to him. You can have no correspondence with him. You can't do emails with him. Um, you must sever, where this all came from, I have no idea, but it was like the guy had leprosy and he's gonna go. So I was stuck in a position running a public company where right or wrong no longer mattered. Steve had to go. I had that responsibility to my shareholders. We had a pending acquisition and had to close. So kind of shook Steve's hand. We, we did what we had to do, signed an agreement, and he went off into the sunset. But I will tell you, I didn't take that very favorably at all. I mean, it was required. It was okay. But the agreement was that he would settle his issue with the SEC, and if, if, and if it was favorably enough settled, we'd find out whether the world thought and regulators thought it was serious enough to prevent him from joining our company at maybe some future date, but I had no certainty, no thought at all that it would get there. Mm -hmm. But over a period of time, Steve did uh, get his situation settled with the SEC, by the way, not admitting any wrongdoing, if I think I have it right, which I think was critical, uh, but settled it and it went away. And of course, then the process, the tough process of what next? Uh, we chose, I think the company chose New Jersey because New Jersey, I'd never met Mr. Oriyama, know him, didn't even know about him at the time, was, and, and still to this day, probably the toughest jurisdiction in the United States. The most thorough, the most thoughtful, the most pick all the adjectives you might like uh, place, but also sophisticated to consider these complicated issues and to make a judgment. And if he could get licensed there, the reasoning was, well, maybe we can go elsewhere with it. Um, but if he can't, uh, it's kind of the end of the game. So we, Steve did apply in New Jersey, and shortening that tale eventually uh, was found suitable. All this is public record, you would know that. And we then went around the United States and uh, secured other approvals to the point where we had every approval in the United States, took that back to Canada, uh, at which point Canada really had not too much to say because it's pretty obvious that that issue was settled, he was licensable and found licensable virtually everywhere else, and he was promptly found licensable in Canada. And then, lo, these many years, in fact, I even heard, haven't heard this issue from any jurisdiction or any place in what, 13 or more years. So this is, Mr. but that's essentially the history of okay. it. Okay, let me stop you there, because I want to uh, ask a few questions about uh, Mr. Donahue's hiring as well. But sort of three data points here, the bringing Mr. Snyder on board as a consultant in 97, and then right. making him a vice president for development in 98, and then a full-time employee in 2000, while these SEC charges were pending. Uh, understanding that and understanding that he had to dissolve his financial advisory service because of this, and there was a state tuition board that he had to remove himself from, and your, your uh, caused issues for you, licensing in, in Canada. Did, did anybody during this period of time in the company uh, say to you, you know, a uh, great guy, talented guy, terrific businessman, but this is, you know, we just don't need this right now. There's, there, there's just too many questions associated with these pending charges that uh, it is a heavily regulated industry. This just isn't, isn't the right personnel. Well, let, let me say this. At that time, 
and the company is very different today, as you probably now recognize, and it was then, uh, because we did not have the same crew of people uh, who would have come on later. So I, I got to remember who our general counsel was at that time, or it, it was a very tiny little group. But the answer probably is no, uh, and that, that decision would have fallen to me. Look, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't care a lot about appearances. I really don't, and that may not be the answer you like. I care about truth, facts, honesty, decency, and whatever, and I'll fight forever on an issue in the end if I think it's right and fair. I made the judgment that this is a good guy, an honest and honorable guy who was caught in a difficult situation, subsequently proved right, by the way, by the facts and circumstances. That's abundantly clear. So, you know, and in America, I used to understand that one is in innocent until proven guilty. And, and, and I'll stand by that. That was my general view. If, the, if he was found to be at fault, then maybe that's something we have to deal about. But at the time, it wasn't critical. To the appointment as a, quote, vice president, I mean, we, we simply had to put something on the guy's business card so he could go out and call on people and represent that he, he, he could speak for the company. But I point out even in banks, I mean, you have a lot of vice presidents who are not officers of the company. He was not an officer of the company. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just uh, ask you a few questions about uh, Mr. Donahue's uh, hiring. Okay. Fast forward uh, 10 years in time here. Uh, uh, Mr. Donahue was hired as the chief compliance officer in July 2011, right. thereabouts. Uh, do you recall being interviewed by investigators from Spectrum in connection with the Ohio due diligence proceedings uh, several months after, after Mr. Donahue's hire. This is in January 2012. Vaguely. I mean, I know I was, but I don't okay. remember. All right. Let me, uh, uh, I think Mr. Albano is finding the reference now. It's page 281 of the suitability report. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and just the, the first full paragraph there. On January 23rd, 2012, in connection with this due diligence investigation for the Ohio Casino Control Commission, Spectrum interviewed Penn National officials at the company's corporate headquarters in Wyoming, missing Pennsylvania. Does yes. that sort of refresh your recollection? Oh, I'm sure they did. I don't recall it, but I know they okay. did. All right. Uh, and that would have been, if that was January 23rd, so that would have been about six months or so after Mr. Donahue was brought on board, correct? Okay. Okay. So uh, down to the last paragraph of that page, uh, Peter Carlino, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Penn National, was interviewed regarding this issue. This is the issue that you know, we've been mm -hmm. hearing a lot about the grand jury. Uh, Carlino t responded that he was generally familiar with the grand jury investigation and knew that a report had been issued, but he was not familiar with the details of the report. Uh, does that sound like an accurate summary of what what you were, would have reported to it the investigators? Probably is. It okay. So, so is, it, is it consistent with your recollection now? I have no recollection. I really don't. But I'll, okay. I see the words, so I'll accept them. All right. Uh, did Did you read the grand jury report when it came out? No. Okay. Uh, you were generally familiar with it, so uh, maybe news accounts uh, or discussions with other... Yeah, my knowledge of that situation was largely that of any citizen, just what was appearing in the press, was aware it was out there. I mean... Fair to say it got a lot of play in the local press. It, it got a lot of play in the local press. Okay. So let me read the last two sentences of that paragraph. He, and referring, referring to your statements to the investigators, stated the investigation was discussed with other officers of Penn National in general terms, but that he, meaning you, did not place any serious significance on the investigation or the report because he did not have confidence that the proceedings would result in an accurate reflection of the operations of the PGCB. He added that he did not place any weight on the report, nor did it play any significant role during Donahue's hiring process. He did not question Donahue about the grand jury during any interviews. Uh, fair summary of your statements to the investigators at that point? If that's what they said I said, then I'll assume I said it. Okay, you don't have a rec recollection no, today that's I, different I really from don't. this. Okay. I don't. Uh, why, why didn't you have 
confidence that the grand jury report would be an accurate reflection of the operations of the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board? <laughs> Uh, is this is this a public record? It is. <laughs> it is indeed. It is. Uh, I, I say, obviously, I say that it's jokingly being live because streamed. yes, no, I understand. Look, the perception at the time was, and I and I won't go into any detail of my meager thoughts about the subject. Is that look, this was a, a highly a shock you here in Massachusetts, of course, but it was a highly political event, um, as various factions were pushing different points of view. Um, so there was more to it. I don't know this De Naples fella. Never heard of him even until this gaming thing came up. It could be a bad guy, an evil guy. That for me wasn't the issue, but rather, uh, let's wait and see what comes out of this. And and um, I, I think the general view was that this was um, an activity that may or may not lead to some result. Again, I'll wait until I see what the outcome would be. The key point is this. I met with, with Frank um, uh, before he was hired, just to, I guess, you know, do the usual things you do, because I had not physically met him before, make sure he doesn't drill on his tie and comports himself in a manner that we'd be pleased with. And, but, but as, and pleased, too, with the kind of background, the, legis the, the regulatory background that I thought he would bring to this process. And in his outreach then to other states, you folks and the other places where we do business so those are the reasons why he would have been highly attractive to me now but my conversation about this would have been with our general counsel you you met Jordan yesterday I, I, he was educated for better or for worse in this state at Harvard as a lawyer uh, he's a terribly bright and extraordinarily thorough and capable guy I can promise you that so my conversation and that I do remember with Jordan is Jordan what's up is there any substance to this? Is there anything I, because I knew he had talked to his team. It would have been with Tom and Steve Ducharme and so forth, and, and all the other work that they had done. Is there anything? This is what a CEO will do. You're not gonna, I'm not gonna get into the detail with that, but I will go to the people responsible, the kind of top people we hire and say, what's up? Can I rely on this? How do you feel about this? Is this a guy we can hire? That conversation I had and the assurance I got back from Jordan Savage was, yes, we, we should hire him. He, he's the right kind of guy for us. And, and that would probably have been the extent, other than an interview, that I would have had with um, Mr. Dunn. Yes. Okay. So, fair to say, you didn't, you didn't read the report. No. Uh, but your lack of confidence that it would reflect an accurate reflection of the Gaming Control Board and your sense that it should place that, that you would place no weight on the report in connection with Mr. Donahue's hiring. That was communicated to you from Mr. Savitz, to whom you would really and, delegate. And various other diligence. people as well. I mean, look, there's been retrospectives. In fact, somebody was just showing me an article in the back there about the Pennsylvania process. With its minor warts, Pennsylvania got it right. And, and by the way, has been the most successful state generating more revenue for uh, any state in the United States than anybody in America, not Nevada, not New Jersey, not any place. So, you know, you're, you're finding this out. To get this industry up and running and to do it right and to do it perfectly is not an easy task. Um, and I think on balance, the Pennsylvania process was an exceedingly good one. Okay. Now, again, I can't speak to the whole the, the Naples question, but I'll say this, again, now as a citizen, they've been trying to get that guy on something for a while. The state police have tried, everybody sort of tried, but in fairness, again, in America, I say to myself, maybe this guy's an angel. I don't know, but nobody's been able to, to pin anything on him, which is, you got to scratch your head and say why. They certainly tried hard enough. And let me just, with respect to Mr. Donahue, uh, same question I asked with respect to Mr. Snyder. Uh, you have the grand jury report. I understand you haven't read it, but you're aware of it. Uh, and you know that Mr. Savitz, uh, Mr. Ducharme, Mr. Oriyama, uh, and others involved in Mr. Donahue's hiring. A number of people are familiar with the report. Did a single person ever say to you, or did you ever hear a single person say, gee, there's something here that we actually should consider and give some weight to? I think they did. That, I mean, of course they did. They did. They looked at it. I mean, there's nobody charged with anything. It's a report. Nobody was accused of any wrongdoing, least of all, 
uh, Mr. Donahue. So, I mean, where's the problem in that? I mean, I, I, I hear where you're going, but, but in the end, where is the problem? There clearly wasn't one. So, I mean, I'll stand on that. But the research was clearly and thoroughly done by our team of folks. Okay, I have no further questions. I have just a couple on a couple of issues. You've, you've talked, uh, Mr. Carlino, about the uh, culture of compliance that Penn has demonstrated since the beginning, uh, a culture that uh, you've described in some detail. You said uh, also that, if I'm quoting you correctly, you found it amusing that um, companies self-report and then get spanked. <laughs> Could you help me understand what you meant by that? Well, yeah. I mean, look, I, what I think is you, you do the things you have to do, but it is sort of discouraging sometimes to have done everything precisely right. In other words, things occur that you just can't stop. All you can do is find them and report them. Sometimes the, res the response that one gets, it depends on the state and the general attitude. I think some of them view it as a revenue raiser. And I'm, I'm actually being serious about that. Um, but it, it strikes me that it's one thing to be charged with something that you have missed and are caught at. Quite another in a situation where you self-report a problem, uh, that where you've done it all right, but yet there's a problem. And I mean, I, so I, 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 I kind of don't appreciate the, the ultra criticism when, in fact, we've done everything we should do. Uh, maybe that's muddled, but if, I think if, you get the idea. If, if you've done everything that you should do, then the fact that the violation occurred is not your fault? Is that it? Often the case, yes, absolutely. I mean, if, if, if for example, uh, you've got tough. Oh, um, like an embezzlement, for example. You can do it all right, but I guarantee you banks get embezzled every day. Uh, no matter how thorough you are, and I promise you, no matter how hard you try, there will be underage folks that will get on the floor. Our problem sometimes is, is states who will then not charge those underage people uh, with, a, with, with a crime uh, and, and, and prosecute them um, for having done that as a deterrent, obviously, to others. Do you believe that the uh, imposition of a fine, even for a self-reported thing, may constitute an incentive to find ways to do it better? Um, in our case, I would say probably it doesn't help because we're doing it better every day. And I'm not being smart about that. We really, really, really work hard to be a, like a, a zero defects company. We take this very seriously, but you're dealing with tens of thousands of people uh, through, you know, multiple states and so forth, and, um, and people being people. You're going to have a small measure of this stuff. And as I say, and I mean this quite honestly, I think a company always should be judged. You know, it's not kind of what happens to it. It's how you respond to the problem. Do they fix it? Do they take it seriously? Do they, uh, are these people serious about their commitment? And, uh, and indeed, we are. Well, that's what I asked you about, the amusing part. Well, maybe amusing is not the right word. As I say, it is sometimes frustrating. Maybe that's a better choice of words. But, uh, no, but, but make no mistake, those issues are inevitable. And we're as good as it gets. You'll have that, and, and you'll deal with it uh, when the time comes. Let me ask you another uh, question on a different subject, but really along the same line. You, you said that uh, when you were exploring uh, uh, with uh, eminent counsel in Philadelphia, uh, Mr. Snyder's issues with the SEC, uh, that part of his explanation to you was that everybody in the industry was doing it. Uh, and in fact, the exhibit submitted by, uh, uh, by you, by your, by your team, uh, reflects that. Goldman Sachs was doing it, Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Payne Weber, all of them were doing it. To what extent uh, do you think that the fact that an entire industry is doing it makes it right? My recollection of that was that it really was no more than an, an interpretive issue. I mean, obviously, these companies as a group did not blatantly violate the law. Uh, how do you know that? Well, that was our judgment at the time. They, do you realize uh, that they admitted knowing and willful violations of the law? Well, because that's how you get these things settled. That's how you get them settled. I mean, let's be honest. That's how the process not works. Not how Mr. Snyder got it settled. 
Well, but he was, we've already established, was out there on his own and how to deal with it in a very different manner. But, so, But these companies were out there on their own as well, and they admitted knowing a willful violation. Well, but these were, well, again, maybe, this is not a debate that, I'm not trying to debate I'm, with you. I'm not trying to debate I, with I'm, you either. I'm trying to get at the extent to which you believe that industry standards uh, are a norm uh, that um, uh, trumps uh, violations of the law. Let me say this. I, I personally, and I'm speaking just for me, find it hard to believe that responsible companies as a group, somehow all nine or ten of the people involved uh, conspired to do something wrong. I think that, I genuinely think that it was an interpretation of how that, that rule was applied that the federal government then decided was not appropriate and they smacked the industry. But it was, you know, this is not a hidden event. This was, this was public and open and notorious, if you will. Right? It was an activity that everybody knew about. So obviously, somebody thought that it wasn't a bad thing. It subsequently was interpreted to be a bad thing. The issue was settled and it went away. So I, that's the only distinction right. I'm making. And, and, and what, what we, uh, what, what uh, views on what they did is uh, one thing. What, to, to what extent do you believe uh, that if uh, everybody in the gaming industry is doing things a certain way, the conformity with that, uh, conformity with that norm is a sufficient uh, basis for uh, Penn National's policy. If we believe it to be right, uh, I'll stand by that. That is to say, if we believe that what we're doing is correct, and it happens to be whatever, I, I, this is so hypothetical, but look, if we believe it's the right thing to do, we're going to always do the right thing and nothing else. Look, we're in a highly regulated in industry, about that we're not confused. Our gaming license and, and losing a license in one place would be tantamount to losing a license every place. So please don't get the notion at all that we don't take this with ultimate seriousness. We do. We do. I mean, remember, this is all revolving around the situation of yield burning and Steve Snyder. That, that's a very unique situation, 13 or 14 years in the past, but I mean, that, it, it's what we're talking about. Well, I'm, 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 uh, I understand that, and I'm trying to extrapolate from your uh, approach to this, what your approach to I don't think you can extrapolate. That's what I'm trying to suggest. Yeah. Please don't do that, because I don't think it's an appropriate All right. extrapolation. All right, I hear you. Thank you. Uh, my questions have been asked and answered. Yep. Um, a couple of quick questions. Um, and at least from my understanding, a lot of Mr. Snyder's background was in, in municipal finance, municipal uh, financing instruments. Um, but yet he's charged with uh, being vice president of corporate development. And what was it that you saw in his background that you thought made him the best candidate, starting off as a consultant and an eventual hire, uh, to do some of that corporate development work? Um. Well, again, back to context, we were a much, much, much smaller company at that time. Mm -hmm. We hadn't had a single, we hadn't purchased a single gaming company. We were just a racetrack business. I think I had bought one other racetrack by the time Steve joined us. We needed some financial muscle because we're in the finance markets and so forth, precisely the kind of things that, that Steve is good at. We did go to a search firm, an outside firm. He wasn't a friend of mine. I'd never met him before. They said, look, we have a guy in your market uh, who's highly capable, well-respected, so forth. Would you talk to him? And of course, I interviewed him in that context. Um, I did check around town. I, I knew, I talked, I, in fact, with the uh, chairman of Meridian Bank, his former employer at the time, got glowing recommendations and um, seemed like the right guy at, at, at that time for us. Plus, he's there in town. It's not easy to get people to come to Wyoming, Pennsylvania, by the way. So Steve was a very, very strong candidate. And we were pleased to have him at the time. The, uh, <laughs> obviously, the questions that we've had over the past two days are with respect to um, the hiring process for, obviously, two pretty key employees. Um, what role does your senior VP of HR, and I know he's not here, but his title says, you know, recruitment, 
what role does your senior VP of HR have in looking at assessing candidates for you know what are obviously kind of the C level suite positions? Um, I mean, he's got the primary first role, right? So if we announce we want to hire for a particular position, uh, normally it would go through HR to to find candidates. Uh, to vet candidates and, and do all the preliminary checks and you know criminal backgrounds and if it gets that far and all the <laughs> detailed stuff that would happen now for, for, for somebody else somebody at a higher level of course then it goes to the next level it starts there it does start there but then it goes quickly to the office of general counsel to compliance to all the appropriate people that would consider such a person so it goes through many filters along the way and there, are, by the way, there are many. Uh, Tim, I'm sure, can talk about it even better than I, because he deals with it day to day. Um, you know, many are called, but few are chosen. I mean, we, we go through a lot of people, but there are many declined uh, in our business. Many declined. We're, we're tough. It's very difficult to get a position with us at every level. Thank you. Um, this has been, uh, for everybody, I think, um, exhaustive and exhausting, um, but I found it useful and informative. Um, I came into this largely with two different concerns. There were three appointments that had been made that, as I read the report, struck me as odd. One was Mr. Eden's appointment of Mr. Mudd, one was your appointment of Mr. Uh, Snyder, and one was your appointment of Mr. Um, Donahue. And I had two problems with them. One is it seemed to me that there, there might have been hires of people of suspect character and professional integrity. Um, and if, secondly, though, if, if, they, if they weren't of suspect character and integrity, there was an appearance problem. And what process would one go through? What process would your company, in this case also Fortress, what was the process that permitted you to make a judgment that from my standpoint looked like crazy shooting yourself in the foot from a PR standpoint. standpoint. So that's where I started on this conversation. I won't comment on uh, whatever thought I have of Mr. Mudd. My comment on Mr. Snyder on the issue of the, you know, I've, I think you guys present yourselves well and I don't walk away with this of, of sense of, I mean, I, I can really appreciate the complicated issues and how a professional, a CEO like you could come to the conclusion that these were men of integrity, fundamentally men of integrity. Um, I am still troubled by the, the, the wisdom of the appointment, nevertheless. In the case, you know, in the case of M Mudd, um, Mr. Edens, who this is relevant only because Mr. Edens is on your board, but Mr. Right. Edens asked everybody apparently and said, what do you think if we hire this guy Mudd? He just, he's disgraced in the, in the Fannie Mae, but what do you think? We, and he was advised, you know, no problem, hire him. Well, he was wrong. They had to fire him. You um, said to everybody, what do you think about Mr. Snyder? Um, they said, it's not a big deal. Everybody was doing it. I think it's OK. They were wrong. You had to fire Mr. Snyder. But nobody said to you, you know, you might not want to think about hiring Mr. Snyder because I'm not sure the regulatory agencies are going to be comfortable with this guy. Had somebody said that, they would have been right. Mm -hmm. And then in the case of um, Mr. Uh, Donahue, um, Nobody in the process said, uh, it looks odd to me. You know, this doesn't feel right. He's a terrific guy, but how can we hire a guy when I mean, we're in the gaming business? Anyway, there might be regulators like this one who says, wait a sec, this just doesn't, there wasn't anybody. So what I walk away from this is not to be, not a federal case, but but it's a little bit in the nature of what Commissioner McHugh was getting at, you know, is sort of where is your mind at? I don't know who lives in the alternative universe. We in Massachusetts or you in Pennsylvania. In the world that we live in, the ethics parameters under which we operate, the scrutiny under which we operate, the press environment under which we operate, it would be unthinkable to make an appointment like that without just really thinking through the appearance side of it, because appearances matter. Um, and it, I, I, I remain puzzled that that didn't seem to be an issue, uh, that perspective didn't seem to be an issue for you all. Um, 
you're welcome to comment on that, but that's sort of my, my net effect. Well, let me take a, a lame effort <laughs> at least. Uh, in Steve Snyder's case, um, we weren't even in the gaming business at the time he joined us. We were in the racing business, a whole different level of probity there. We're looking for, an ant, for a finance guy. It, wasn't even, it was not even a licensable position at the time. No, it just wasn't. So it was pretty straightforward. We subsequently bought some casinos, and, by the way, and that still was not a problem. We bought the first two casinos in Mississippi, the first we ever bought. It, the problem came up in Canada, and maybe it was an inevitable problem, but so we didn't contemplate at the time Steve joined us where that might lead. But I had confidence in the person. I did. Uh, I stood firm with that. And, and boy, have I been rewarded over the many years that I have remained loyal to Steve and he to us. He's been a great hire, admired by all, and, and every and all places where he and we do business. Of, of, of that, I have absolute confidence. In the situation with Frank, um, I'm not sure I perceived the, I mean, the, what you have described as the magnitude of the issue. I think it could have been a really serious issue. But as it was only a report, and maybe I don't understand, even though I've talked to counsel about it, you know, what the potential impact was, but I frankly didn't see it as, um, as a potential threat to our reputation. I, look, obviously, I would never hire someone. Uh, who would be a threat to our reputation or, uh, or a black mark on the company. I mean, you probably gather here that I bring a tremendous amount of passion to what we do as a business. I care hugely about this. I'm the largest shareholder. I've been in this business my entire life. Uh, so, yeah, I do care. Um, you may be right that w w we missed it. Let's look at Frank for a minute. but. This is the first time it has come up, and he is licensed in all those other jurisdictions. Now, again, this is here, that's there, and you can care not one bit about it, but we've been rewarded, so to speak, by the, in, in our judgment to date, and I hope you'll come to the same conclusion that, on balance, this is a good guy, a, a, a skilled, capable, solid, good guy that Penn should be proud to have. Now, maybe we missed something, but... But please don't leave with the thought that we don't take this seriously and that we don't passionately care about doing the right thing. There is no company in the United States that cares more than we about being the best, doing the best, and living up to our responsibilities. And again, you can pick up the phone call and talk to some of the places where we've been for a long time. And I have great confidence that they'll say, the Penn guys are good guys. And they do what they say. So I, I, that's the only way I can answer it, sir. Fair enough. Anybody else? No, that's very helpful. Thank Mr. you. Carlino. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much. Thank you. Uh, I get wound up sometimes. <laughs> I have a, I apologize. A, a radical suggestion to make. Um, I would not want to deprive um, our last guest of an opportunity to take center stage, but I don't know that it's necessary unless you all feel it's necessary. But I just put that out as a suggestion. I don't know that. Uh, certainly from my standpoint, there's nothing that I need to talk to Mr. Wilmot about that I uh, haven't already covered. We have, we have no objection to that. If they're, they're May I have just one moment? Sure. sure. Sorry to have you come all this way, but... <laughs> he's, he's the smartest guy at the table here. <laughs> you heard me, now you hear the best. Yes, uh, we're content uh, to leave poor Mr. Wilmot uh, in, in the back. I have been asked if we would be permitted to make about a five-minute closing statement. Absolutely. You have, you have that right in any event, and whoever wants to do it may do it. 
No, I mean, you're, you're, you're entitled to an opportunity to make a closing statement of whatever wish you long, you like, all you just risk the wrath of the commission if it's very long. I might, might. <laughs> <laughs> My plan was, was that on very the, long. Was that on the record? <laughs> <laughs> That's not He's, what he meant. Sorry, <laughs> sir. sorry, Commissioner. Excuse I me, slipped. just let me grab my notes to make sure I will be free. Just to make clear, you have the, you have the right to make a, a closing statement of whatever length and content you wish, without prejudice. I will be brief. Um, I did want to thank um, not just the commission, but also uh, the staff and inside and outside council um, for all of the work that's been quite obvious to us that we've seen a grueling couple of days for, as we were talking about uh, earlier, and I know many grueling days behind you and ahead of you. Um, and on behalf of Penn, I, I do sincerely want to thank uh, you for the time to consider the witnesses that we brought here. Um, when I read the Raynham decision that the commission issued, I uh, couldn't help but notice the um, quote from the New Jersey decision about um, how to define character. and. Uh, that court held that character is the sum total of an individual's attributes, the thread of intention, good or bad, that weaves its way through the experience of a lifetime, and says that we should judge a person's character by evaluating his words and deeds as they appear from the testimony and from all of the evidence in the record before us to focus on those attributes of trustworthiness, honesty, integrity, and candor, which are relevant to our inquiry. In essence, I would suggest that is a practical approach that looks at the totality of the evidence, the totality of the company, the totality of the people who came before you here. Um, the totality of the circumstances we suggest, shows here clearly and convincingly that the company and all of the qualifiers meet the statutory definition of suitability under Chapter 23K. I, I would suggest that the dedication to compliance, to high standards of performance was compelling, was, pers was pervasive. And I think there are a couple of solid pieces of evidence that one can look at here. Um, it is not an accident that the applicant and these qualifiers have been licensed in so many jurisdictions so many times over so many years. <clears throat> it is not an accident that not one of them ever has been denied uh, a suitability determination. And it's, it's not an accident that in some of those jurisdictions, those determinations were made based in part on an investigation done by a highly respected and professional expert firm, Spectrum, that did the investigation here. And that in those cases, the outcome was all the same, that there was a suitability determination. I know that the company recognizes that the questions that have been raised here in these past two days by the Commission are important ones. And, and in fact, I know that they have been taken much to heart and considered, and will be considered moving forward. I, I would ask, however, that those questions be viewed in context. And here, I would say that one highly relevant and important measure of whether the processes 
used by a company to select its executives is sufficiently diligent, sufficiently exhaustive, is to look at the product, the people who got hired, and to judge the character, the integrity, the honesty of the people who survive that process. So again, it is not an accident that Penn became an industry leader. It's not an accident that they are an industry model of financial stability. And it's not an accident, although we only heard a bit of testimony about this, that they make the kinds of contributions they make to the communities they're in. All of those results are the direct product of the hiring process because you only achieve those results from the people whom you have hired. And, and so could the processes be better? Yes, they could be. Um, are the people all perfect? No, they're not. But in fairness, no question from Mr. Mackey or from the commission suggested th that that was the expectation or the standard that we would produce perfect people from this process. But I, I do say this, that if we're measuring did the process work, then one really ought to look at who has come here before you over the last two days and judge their integrity, their character, their honesty. And, and the other explicit factors, and here I will refer to the statute, that are in Section 12, beyond what those witnesses' honesty. Do, do, do the applicants bring financial stability and a history of compliance with gaming licensing requirements in other jurisdictions? Yes. Do they have the business practices and the business ability to establish and maintain a successful gaming establishment? Well, absolutely, that seems to be all they do. And they've done it for, for quite some time successfully in so many jurisdictions. So, so yes, the statutory factors we say are met. I, when you consider the circumstances of Mr. Snyder's hire, Mr. Mudd's hire, and Mr. Donahue's hire, there are certain things I would ask you uh, to keep in mind. One is, um, just, let me start with Mr. Snyder. Obviously a complex area of the law. Um, I can say why the applicants submitted that list of all of the um, organizations in the industry who uh, ran into similar yield burn problems. And I could, it was definitely not an attempt to mount an argument of everybody does it, so therefore it must have been okay. What it was an attempt to do was to support Mr. Snyder's testimony that as a young man in that industry, when he looked around at how people had tried to solve this problem that is created by the confluence of IRS regulations that say, municipality, thou shalt not make a dime more than you would have made on the first financing, or the tax exemption explodes and everybody's very unhappy. And the SEC regulations that say, in the end, thou shalt not calculate yield based on the portfolio because you get some crazy outcomes on some securities, so do it on a per security basis. That exhibit merely shows that if we try and go back in time and figure out 17 to 20 years ago, what was in Mr. Snyder's head? How was he trying to deal with this in a company that supported it, where he used the company software to come up with the um, proper uh, 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 markup, uh, that that's a harder decision. That was a harder position to be in than it appears today when new regulations have made it absolutely clear 
how to handle that situation. Of course, it's also true that the incident occurred, that the transactions occurred 17 to 20 years ago. It was important to him that he admitted no wrongdoing. Um, the guy was left a, a, a bit on his own. He lost his job. Uh, he had to defend himself. He won it back only by subjecting himself to what at the time was considered the most rigorous uh, licensing process uh, and known in the country. And, and he went through that. And he passed. And he's passed every time he's been reviewed <coughs> since then. From Penn's perspective, I mean, what the evidence showed, Mr. Carlino mentioned, um, we're in the 1990s. Okay, again, remember, we're in the 1990s. This is a different company in the 1990s than it is today. But we're in the 1990s, and he goes to seek outside counsel about how to assess the situation that Mr. Snyder presents. And as Mr. Savage said, after the departure of Mr. Snyder and his return, Mr. Savage went to the Ballard firm again to assess the situation. Now, we can think of, and I think many people did over the course of the last two days, how one might have otherwise structured the review. But I would say it, it can't be suggested that those processes were in any way cavalier. And that there is a match, I would say, between the statutory factors that the commission applies and the factors that somewhat more colloquially, colloquially um, Mr. Carlino talked about, because he was talking about assessing Mr. Snyder's integrity, his character, his honor, and there does need to be room for that, even in a highly regulated, maybe particularly in a highly regulated industry, for those types of judgments to be made. Uh, unfortunately for Penn, if uh, this REIT transaction, I shouldn't say if, or people will start having coronaries behind <laughs> me, but if the REIT transaction uh, moves forward, um, and gaming loses, in a sense, Mr. Snyder, because he will be moving over uh, to the REIT. But, but still, it's re he's a qualifier, and it's highly relevant to the, to the commission's um, determinations. The same is true of Mr. Uh, Edens, by the way. Um, Mr. Edens would move over uh, to the REIT. Um, here's what, I wanted, what, I, what I'd ask you to think of when you consider the fortress situation and Mr. Mudd. We did make a decision, I think it was the appropriate one. Now we, now I'm talking about us three. We made a decision that we probably shouldn't try to use these proceedings to determine the cause of the financial crisis. Uh, to bring out uh, the statements made by Alan Greenspan about the strength of the subprime market minutes before it implodes. Or the FCIC commission report that after I think they, uh, 700 witnesses and millions of documents said Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were not the cause of the financial crisis and if you compare the default rates of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac servicing average citizens, the default rate of their subprime package to the default rate of the private banks, that it is somewhere the GSC's default rate is somewhere around six. The default rate of the private banks are somewhere around 28%. So what's the old saying? I, we decided to pass over that in silence, I guess, until, until now. And, and, and deal with what seems to me to be quite a proper issue. Um, how did Fortress handle the situation where a member of its, uh, its board and, and an officer of the company was sued by the SEC in a civil action. And what the record shows is that he was almost instantly put on leave of absence. And within 30 days, they had his resignation. 
um, that, I think, that chronology is, bears the most on that issue, which, again, to put in context, is the issue of how a board of another company, not Penn, another company that has no role in the management of Penn, handled the removal of a board member who was sued in a civil action. And, and, and so that is what I'd ask you to consider um, when you think about and determine the relevance of, of Fortress's decisions with respect to Mr. Mudd. Um, that leaves Mr. Donahue. Um, Mr. Donahue, although a young man at the time of his service on the board, does in fact, did in fact have a long and distinguished career in law enforcement, in public service. What the evidence shows is that Mr. Donahue made a reasoned legal judgment when asked to give his advice as chief counsel to the board. When the issue arose in the context of a grand jury investigation, he cooperated fully. He held nothing back. He was one of about 20 agency employees, apart from other witnesses, hauled before that grand jury. Not charged with any wrongdoing, not civilly, not criminally. Uh, and, and, and what did Penn do? Well, it, once all the evidence came in, it became clear that what Penn did was have its general counsel read the grand jury report to people in their, their most senior compliance people who, what was the evidence, I think somewhere like 65 years or something of combined experience, read the grand jury report, analyze what is there and what is not there. And then we learned that Mr. Savage actually talked to some other people uh, uh, too in, 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 uh, in the course of the investigation. And I would suggest that what those folks saw when they read the grand jury report was what I believe we saw when we heard Mr. Donahue testify, that it was not reasonable, fair, or just to have Mr. Donahue's testimony before that grand jury be in any way considered an impediment to his career. I, I would suggest that what you saw in Mr. Donahue was a lawyer who made a call. I don't know any lawyer who has never lost a case. I, I certainly have. Um, sometimes, I don't like to say this, but sometimes probably because I was out lawyered, but I know I've lost them. I know I drive, a, I, I can be driving alone in the car and say out loud to myself, why didn't I think of that argument in a case that was tried in 2005? So uh, yes, you can make mistakes, but I, at least I can say to myself in those situations, I know I tried, I know I did my best. And so can Mr. Donahue, and so did he, uh, when he testified here and when he made the judgment that he made. Um, I, I, I was, I was <laughs> and am proud to have represented him in this case. And for Penn to apply their standards that, again, I think do mirror some of the statutory standards, that, that they say we will look beyond the report, the fact of the report, and actually study what does it tell us about Frank Donahue. And, and what it told them and what the commission learned 
is that there is this implication that Mr. Donahue had made an order that he said he didn't make. We, we learned today, not only didn't he make the order, but until today, he was never asked in any proceeding about his side of the story, about what happened at that meeting. Because even the Spectrum Report acknowledges that there is no indication that Mr. Donahue was ever given that opportunity during the grand jury hearing, and he confirmed that to you. So I, on Mr. Donahue's hire, I say, if you apply the suitability standards of the statute, that you, you will be doing, in essence, what the company did and said, what is important here is not to sacrifice someone because of a headline, which is the decision Penn made, but what is important is to assess his honesty, his integrity, and his character, and, and, and he satisfies, more than satisfies, uh, those standards. That's why, in the end, we are asking, based on you know, largely, of course, Spectrum's report, but also what you will have to decide is, you, you'll judge those witnesses, um, but our position is that they did satisfy the statutory uh, standards for suitability. And we ask that this commission do what all those other jurisdictions have done, not because you must defer to those other jurisdictions, because you need not, um, but because it is, as the hiring decisions were, the right, fair, just thing to do based on an assessment of the honesty and integrity of the people who are here before you. And so for that reason, we do ask for a favorable suitability ruling on the applicant and all of the qualifiers. And uh, greatly appreciate the time. And I, I guess I was not as brief as I promised I would be. So that's a mark against me, not against them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. O'Connell. Are we all set? Yep. Anything else, anybody? We, 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 do we need a motion to adjourn? Uh, sure. Oh, um, how would I you have, like to do that? I would move that we adjourn. <laughs> do we have a second? Second. Sure. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.